morning, everybody. Hi. Who's excited for day two? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, one more round of applause for the lovely conference staff. This is not an easy production, and they work very, very hard. So please give them a huge round of thank you so much. Um, so tonight, there will be a gala dinner. If you're worried about your attire, as long as you're within the code of conduct, your attire is fine. So don't worry about it being a gala dinner, and that'll be at 7 at the restaurant upstairs where we had pizza last night. And then at 8.30, there will be a casino in the other room, so we'll be able to, to play games and things like that, and that'll be fun. So hopefully you'll join us. Uh, so first up, we have Ethan. Ethan's with Vercel, and Ethan is going to be talking about, oh, sorry, fun fact about Ethan. He's a professional children's ski instructor. So he teaches like pizza, french fries, pizza, french fries. So <laughs> let's welcome Ethan and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right, good morning, folks. Let me get this turned on here. We'll get rolling. All righty. OK, so today we'll be talking about um, making Fetch happen. You can see uh, some social handles there at the bottom. And if you're confused about what kind of Fetch we're going to be talking about today, this is a little visual demonstration. Um, you know, it's a really great sport. Um, it's really difficult. It revolve, involves a lot of coordination, you know, a lot of strength, a lot of practice. So, um, so today we're going to start off, you know, it takes some biomechanics, usually involves a partner. This one's named Lincoln. Um, it's a work in progress, though. <laughs> but really, Fetch, as we know it, starts back in 2005 with AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And this is a concept that basically let browsers talk to servers, is the sort of simplest way to put it. And the AJAX protocol, or whatever you want to call it, is, uh, was accessed through an API called XML HTTP request. And if you ever had to write code like this, I'm sorry. I'm so much happier with the way we write networking interfaces today. But it all started with a specification, XHR. And the XHR specification was originally introduced by a working group called um, WhatWig, Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. And then it got passed along to the World Wide Web Consortium, and then back to WhatWig. And to deal with those early politics, I will spare you the details. But um, basically, to put it, uh, to, to sort of summarize, there was a standard, it was specified, and browsers implemented that standard. And that's how we had applications, web applications, be able to run across the old, you know, uh, Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Opera, Chrome, etc. In 2013, a new um, specification came out from W3C called Service Workers, and this um, and this this specification was sort of a way to it was what we deem as a programmable network proxy. And programmable network proxies essentially say, hey, my website can't reach the server right now, but I still want it to be functional. I still want it to serve some data or do something. And that's where the service workers came in. And, and this was a really great sort of like next step towards, all right, we've got web applications and they talk to things, they use those network requests, but sometimes that network isn't available, so let's make things a little more um, easier for people to use. We talk about asynchronous programming a lot. And this is where we got promises. The promises API was introduced to make this asynchronous programming easier. It was able to make this things like service workers um, easier to use. So you can say, hey, my website, I would like this data, but I don't, I'm not sure how this is going to go. Maybe it gets back to me, maybe it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then that's okay. I will invoke my service worker and things will be all right. But something was still missing. We needed better networking interfaces because the, the, that original XML request I showed at the beginning was, was still quite a mess to use and was, was definitely not easy. And this is where fetch came in. And so we're all very familiar with a, a chunk of code like this. And in three simple lines, you had um, your data. Now, await didn't come at the original. We had then callbacks and whatnot. But the point being is fetch allowed 
um, networking interfaces to just be simpler and easier to use for everyone. They employed modern async patterns. They had class-based networking interfaces that we all know and love, the request object, the, the headers class. And it was based on the existing core standard. And the core standard, cross-origin resource sharing, um, also created by W3C, was very important for, inter for, for browser security. It's why we're able to like, use credit cards and store emails and passwords in our browser nowadays because um, the World Wide Web consortiums were like, hey, we want to make sure you're safe when you do this and that your, your password isn't going to get like, shared across 50 million different websites. And sometimes it still happens, and Cores hasn't solved all of our problems. And if you've ever faced a Cores issue while building a Node.js app, I feel for you, because it's the worst. Nonetheless, more standards came across. There was the URL standard, the stream standard, and the abort controller standard. Um, and so all of these came together. Um, and this is what sort of, or this is what was being added to our browsers over time. And it was a timeline. Remember, uh, Ajax was 2005. Service Workers was 2013. And then Promises came around the similar time. URL, I actually had a hard time finding a date for. But the Streams API was 2015. The Abort Controller API was 2017. And you can see over time, our browsers have, or the browsers worked to develop this Fetch API. And this was awesome. And this was really great. We had this wonderful, safe API that was extensible. It was easy to use. Developers could build wonderful asynchronous programs with, without a lot of headache. And what this led to is this concept of isomorphic JavaScript. This is something we all know and love, where you can take this chunk of code and you can run it anywhere JavaScript works. Because every, well, we'll say every JavaScript engine should know what an array is. Every JavaScript engine should know what a function is. Every JavaScript engine who matches the current spec of JavaScript knows the reduce uh, method and how that works. And so the idea is that you can run this code anywhere you can run JavaScript. But what about this code? On the browsers, using the document API, this works just fine. Essentially, if there's a document global, as specified by certain browser standards, not the language standard, this code works. But this is still JavaScript, because if you tried to run this in Python, I guarantee you it wouldn't work very well. But if you ran it in Node.js, it also won't run very well, because there's no such thing as a document global or at least there isn't today, and I, I don't know if there ever will be. <laughs> and in today's modern world, we have a lot of environments to contend for, and this isn't even the full list. Um, in fact, I, I kind of love this slide, because when I gave this talk a few months ago, I didn't even have the Bun logo up there, and I kind of forgot about the Safari logo, so I messed that up, but I added the Safari one, and now we've got Bun up there, and hopefully there's going to be, this, li this slide's going to like cascade, and we're going to have 16 different environments in the future because, well, we want interoperable JavaScript. And the idea goes back to, okay, if you can run JavaScript on all these platforms and that, you know, the simple um, little, you know, sum array function can work on all of them, but this one can't, but the Fetch API is so wonderful, what's stopping us from running Fetch or adding Fetch to all of these different environments? In Node.js, it kind of started way back in 0.3.6 with the request API. And we all are familiar with this one. It actually kind of looks like that XML, uh, XML API I showed at the very beginning, where you sort of have to use like event handlers to, to use it. It's not as simple as just request and then magic string. But what this underlying API let people do was develop a bunch of different options. We got the actual request library that was only recently, in the past couple of years, de uh, deprecated. We have Got, which is still actively used. We have Axios, which is still very widely used. And we even have Node Fetch, which up until recently and still does, is polyfilled in a ton of environments to deliver that Fetch experience. But my favorite comic, you know, how standards proliferated. And you know, we start with, there's 14 competing standards. There's all these different ways you can make a network request. So how do we solve this problem? Well, well, wait, I have an idea. Another standard. Now there's 15. So where does this leave us? Well, let's, let's think about, you know, as much of a joke this is, the idea is, yes, the fetch standard 
is what a lot of people are familiar with. This is what every browser developer knows and loves. And even more so, a lot of backend developers, too, are using Fetch heavily, either polyfilled from Node Fetch or some other implementation. And why is this? Well, there's a variety of different pros and cons to each networking library that exists. For, for Got, it's so simple. Like, I was able to include the import statement, and this chunk of code is still only three lines. That is how simple some of these networking libraries are. But then there's efficiency. This is one of my favorites. This is Undici using the Stream API, and oh man, this one makes me excited because you can run some really fast networking code, but 17 lines for a single network request? Not for everybody. And then there's familiarity. So here's that fetch API from, the, from Node Fetch, still only a couple lines, and it's really great. And so clearly, fetch has a lot to offer, and the community as a whole has asked for fetch and has worked towards landing it in something like, in, in our runtime, Node.js. And so for a sort of squish timeline, we can start all the way back in 2014 when GitHub decided to add fetch, and then people tried isomorphic fetch, which was sort of a balancing act between the browser and node environment. And then we got node fetch in 2015, that was when it was first created. 2017, NPM tried to make fetch happen. And then over time, we had cross fetch, which was another kind of isomorphic attempt. Then there was add fetch to Node.js back in 2018. This was a, um, I, I forget exactly where this, this one landed, but you can see the, the, the issue numbers sort of double every time someone tries to add fetch to Node.js, <laughs> because in 2019, we are like, you know, another 10,000 um, issues later, and we're finally trying, now we're trying to vendor the Node fetch package. That one did not land either. In 2020, this was recently when Undici sort of reached its version one. I took a stab at implementing fetch with Undici. That sort of made its way into Undici. And then from Undici, we added it to Node.js. And finally, on February 1st, 2022, we actually added fetch to Node.js. It's gonna be a global fetch, and it's still experimental in version 18. And it's available even as early as version 16 using the experimental fetch flag. And this is a huge amount of work because there was a ton of other Node.js and Wig APIs that needed to be added. And this is, um, this is a breakdown of the URL API from, from Wig was added way back in version six and seven. And then it wasn't until versions 14 that the, that the next Wig API necessary for fetch was adopted. And this was event target. A board controller came next. And you can see some of these were not, now, nowadays they're non-experimental, but they were only non-experimental in version 15. We're still using 16 today, 18's around the corner, 19 releases around the corner, and web streams is still currently experimental. Structured clone, we heard a lot about yesterday, was only added in version 17 as non-experimental, which was pretty good, kind of a jump forward. But then form data was added in 16 plus, and this is what only added whenever fetch is enabled. So I'm not even sure exactly how form data is gonna play out in Node.js, but it is a part of the fetch implementation. And then web crypto, added just in version 18, and still experimental, will let us do some of the, more, the newer fetch, um, parts of the fetch uh, implementation. And we're only getting started, because while all this work has been done in Node.js to get fetch um, available and to get fetch into our users' hands, a new community group was started by a lot of awesome companies all developing runtimes. Uh, including members of Node.js called Winter CG. And I love this name because, as you've heard, I'm a professional ski instructor. I love the winter. I'm wearing a hat that says, you know, protect our winters. So the fact that the working group that hopefully can push the fetch standard forward in runtimes is called Winter CG, huge fan. Um, and we're currently hard at work. So this is a quick screenshot of the Winter CG Fetch repo. We have 10 open issues of discussions of all different topics, ranging from how we're gonna handle cookies, to the request response differences, to even the very first issue down at the very bottom, number one, standardized, supported subset of Fetch. The idea is, on the, on, the, on the run times, we don't need cores. So we can ignore a huge chunk of the fetch API, and if we can say, okay, no more cores, no more cores headers in fetch when it comes to being inside of a server, inside of a runtime, 
That will be something that all of us can standardize around, from Bun to Node.js to Deno to, to workers from Cloudflare to the edge runtime from Vercel. Everyone can do the same thing, and now we can achieve a similar interoperability that the browsers have. And finally, one of the, the current next steps in the fetch work is we're adding the Whatwig fetch spec to the winter CG, and then we're going to iterate on it. We're going to remove sections. We are going to take blocks of it and say, no, 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 we're going to do things differently. The API is going to do this instead, or the API will just sort of halt execution here. And so if you're interested in getting involved, the Winter CG um, is open, is working in public, so you can check out the repo, you can check out the PRs. There isn't a bunch of work done just at this moment. It's very new. It happens every two weeks we meet and we discuss this. So I always like to end these talks with a big thank you to contributors. Without all of the work going all the way back to the browser specifications in 2005, which you know, which created Ajax in the first place, we wouldn't be where we are today with networking APIs, even in the back end for Node.js. So thank you through and through to everyone involved for landing APIs in Node.js and now the folks involved in Winter CG. And I'll leave you today with another picture of my dog. Thank you. You can find me on these socials. Please reach out if you have any questions at any time. Thank you for coming to my talk today. All right. Uh, come on up. Uh, yeah. So next we're going to have Liran, who's going to talk about the terrors of past traversal vulnerabilities. I'm really excited about this talk. I've been learning a little bit about security lately, and uh, so I'm really excited to see this. And fun fact, the hat. <laughs> I love the hat. I'm a Star Wars fan. Um, but yeah, uh, let's... Uh, We'll get the slides up, and then we'll give it up for Liran. <laughs> but first, I have a dad joke, and this is from the indomitable James Snell. Where do fathers keep their jokes? A database. <laughs> but be careful, the sequel is always worse. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, let's give it up for Liran. All right, it's gonna be a minute here, just getting everything uh, and our demo straight up working. All right, so um, thank you everyone for coming to my talk. Good morning, my name is Iran Tal. I'm a developer advocate at Sneak, where we build free developer security tools. I'm also involved in a bunch of security research, disclosing vulnerabilities for NPM packages, and just generally doing uh, some fun stuff with JavaScript with everyone here, which is also a really good opportunity to basically uh, Thank all of you for being here, and you know, just take a uh, thank Nearform, thank uh, everyone in our very welcoming and supportive JavaScript community, who I've been lucky enough to collaborate with, learn from, and just build silly JavaScript things together. So, thanks, thanks to all of you. So, as developers, we are often made aware of the general public concern of application security issues, things like uh, you know, vulnerable NPM packages. Uh, malicious actors on the ecosystem. You know, we see those news, we see these things kind of coming up now and then. And so today, what I wanted to do is really take a moment to just kind of share my experiences of a specific code security issue, patch reversal vulnerabilities, and kind of talk also about why this is such a significant security concern that is impacting everything from web applications to routers and maybe cars, uh, but essentially have very devastating implications on these web applications. So hopefully, uh, after this talk, you will be able to recognize vulnerable code, see those patterns, and then apply those day-to-day -day in your coding uh, habits at work. So with that, I think we kind of need to define and kind of like demystify what is actually path traversal. And so to understand that, this is kind of the Wikipedia dictionary definition of path traversal, which is also known as directory traversal. Uh, but if we call out very specific things and highlight what's like really important here is the idea of this being a vulnerability is essentially because of insecure coding practices such as not validating 
uh, input, input that is actually user supplied and is related to accessing files, and that goes straight into things like accessing the file system API, which is a very sensitive operation for operation si uh, operating systems or uh, just essentially applications. And the outcome of that is, of course, uh, the fact that we're actually uh, being able to traverse a file path and access paths that we shouldn't have to begin with. So how does it look like in practice? What's, how do you execute a path traversal attack? Well, it is a very simple attack to execute in essence, right? You simply put in uh, an HTTP request, shoot it out, uh, you define uh, you know, your path traversal path with those dot, dot slashes, so you try to traverse up to a directory on the server that is potentially not protected as it should. And if you are successful of doing it, and you potentially hit something like you know, config uh, JSON, which is you know, very commonly a very common asset in web applications, then you might be able to access things like this database credentials for a server and so on. But why are we talking about path traversal to begin with? Uh, because vulnerability reports that we're seeing day to day are you know, cross-site scripting and code injection and prototype pollution. So what makes path traversal so important for me to talk to you today? It's not even on the OWASP top 10 document, which is an awareness document that lists all of those you know, top 10 web common uh, security weaknesses that we should be aware of. It's not even here, despite being, you know, injection, having uh, insecure design, vulnerable and outdated components, but path traversal is not here. So we kind of need to understand what are the two main concerns, in my opinion, for path traversal. They are essentially, I've divided them into two categories. One is the fact that with path traversal happening, you have access for very much sensitive information on a server running this. Right, so you can access things like you know, that config JSON thing if you have it, or that env file, or uh, your node modules, and I can actually see the code of the node modules, or your package JSON, and then find out which outdated dependencies you have that I can actually then escalate the attack, or your SSH keys if this is some servers that connect into other servers, and so on and so on. And so that actually relates to another issue, which is the one on the right, the vulnerability chaining, which is an actual security term from the CVSS document that says, I can take, you know, I can start off uh, an attack with path traversal, but due to all of the information around it and the insecurity of an application, I can escalate that to things like remote code execution and far more worse uh, scope of attack. So let's see some examples in the wild and then dive into how this actually happens uh, in other cases. So Zimbra is a mail server uh, that's kind of like oftenly used by you know, maybe vendors and enterprises and so on, and it was found vulnerable to uh, a path traversal attack. You know, imagine mail server, you send files, compressed, you need to uncompress them, do something with them and so on. But that actually elevates the scope of this attack to an unauthenticated remote code execution. This is really recent vulnerability, as you can see by the CVE date from 2022, and it's so widespread and potentially harmful due to path traversal and its elevated scope that the CISA, which is a US government agency related to cybersecurity, has issued an alert and a report to basically advise everyone to upgrade and apply fixes. In fact, you would imagine that smart people who build HTTP web servers all day, not just you know, general node applications and CLIs or whatever, would you know, get path traversal right, right? Like for 30 years or whatever of building the HTTP uh, Apache web server, there are still all the time path traversal vulnerabilities, and these are really smart people building this, and this is a web server. Like it's, by definition, it's very core path uh, uh, of work is to work with paths and URLs and whatever. And so even more, I think, important to see here is how it is a little more complex than maybe potentially other vulnerabilities to even fix, because this specific CVE happening last year affecting this web server, not only been categorized as critical severity, but also if you look at the actual change logs and the details, this is related and due to an incomplete fix of a different path traversal vulnerability that was applied before. So it even wasn't really straightforward how to fix this. How do you attack a web server? Well, that web server is specifically vulnerable to this kind of payload. Again, it looks simple and it looks harmless, but it isn't, right? It's very potentially devastating. So you apply this uh, payload to a vulnerable server of that version, and you can access these kind of files on the server. In fact, I didn't really need to do much to find this payload. I just searched on Twitter, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, you probably uh, follow a lot of people on the dev side of things. Well, there are a lot of, uh, you know, InfoSec and uh, kind of like Black Hat uh, 
people out there on Twitter as well, and I've actually shared, and um, I can share the Twitter link afterwards, but if you can notice the, you know, the bit of the, uh, of the green and uh, black background there, that actual payload that they share there is affecting this server, but is actually escalating the attack to run an ID command on the Linux server. So, you know, this is uh, kind of what we need to deal with and protect against. So I wonder at this point, if we're getting path traversal APIs and you know, just general file path APIs for granted, are we just taking them for granted? Because their differences uh, and nuances are you know, very, very small. They're very subtle between you know, what a path join is, how is that different from path resolve or normalize? How do they work differently? What's the actual you know, uh, potential uh, pitfalls with any of them? So with that, you know, kind of to begin with here, you know, why am I, at all vulnerable if I, you know, if we look at code, why is that code vulnerable to begin with? How do we avoid different permutations of path traversal happening for us? And then, you know, trying to provide you with this talk some secure coding practices of how to uh, implement them in your day-to-day -day code so you are not vulnerable to path traversal uh, in the future. So what a better way to learn than, you know, looking at vulnerable code and, you know, trying to understand, you know, what the fix was, why was it vulnerable, and so on. So here's some path uh, traversal in an NPM package. This specifically is affecting a package called ST, which eloquently uh, has described itself as a module for serving static files. It's pretty popular, existing uh, you know, for a while on the ecosystem and having a bunch of uh, downloads uh, per week, about half a million of them. So you know, it's pretty useful. Uh, it's used to like, serve maybe CSS or images or whatever you want to serve. Um, and its usage is also pretty simple, right? You, if you have an express application, you use it as an express middleware thing. You provide the path uh, to things like slash public. Uh, you provide the URL, which is where you want things accessible, and you fire it off, and that's it. It's gonna go and serve all the static files. Well, what if we try to attack it? What if we try to then push in an HTTP request with that dot, dot, slash and try to access the node uh, test app that I have here with this work? Luckily, it doesn't. At this point, this doesn't work. But why doesn't it work is why you know, this is interesting. So I you know, looked ahead, uh, looked at the ST, um, the ST uh, uh, codes, and you know, here is the, the actual uh, important information out of it that handles all of this you know, path reversal things. But there's a get path function in this uh, module code, and what essentially it does, and we'll walk through it as a, as a kind of simple debugger simulation here, it gets the URL that you're actually requesting, you know, slash public, slash dot, dot, slash, package.json. That is then handed off to a URL core module that then parses the URL and tries to access path name to essentially uh, uh, extract that information. There is more regular expression parsing being done here to uh, remove funky related uh, slashes and so on. And then that's handed off to normalize the, the path core module in Node that has a normalize, uh, you know, function in it. And essentially, what you could think of normalize as kind of what evil is to JavaScript. That is sort of what path normalizes to you know, string URLs. It kind of goes through all of those, you know, dot, dot, slash, and whatever it needs to resolve, and resolves them into the actual URL that should be accessed. So this normalize function takes this and turns this into package JSON, which is you know, the path traversaling path. And so the next part of this, uh, of this code, of this ST module, runs this conditional check that essentially tries to see if there is an overlap between the requested URL, which in this case was resolved to slash package JSON, and what we have defined as the actual public path, which is you know, slash public, and so because that doesn't satisfy the condition, it returns a false and we get a 404. So far, so good. Let's run about a new trick. This thing called URL encoding, you've probably seen it, you've probably fixed it, you've probably written features around it. Uh, essentially, it's also called, um, um, known as percent encoding. We can specifically uh, encode URLs or uh, parts of a URL in a, uh, using a percent encoding kind of style. So dot dot turns into percent to E, percent to E. If we provide a path and we try to kind of like bypass this whole check that ST has inside, and we now change the path logic of that request from dot dot to percent to E, percent to E, what do we get? So path name just gets the URL as is, and as it's passed to path normalize, well, path normalize doesn't do anything with percent to E, percent to E, because that's not an actual path to resolve. So this goes as is and stays percent to E. Next up, the rest of this code goes to a function called decode URI component. Decode takes 
URL encoded parameters, and as is expected, decodes them. So percent to %e becomes dot, dot, slash. So we've essentially bypassed the conditional check for the scope of the path, and now we're already all the way in to just now serving the file, okay? Which is a bad thing. So the whole, anything here around path join or path resolve, whatever, we've essentially uh, bypassed the whole uh, trick of trying to protect against path reversal attack. And if I send a request with dot uh, percent to E percent to E as a path reversal to a vulnerable express, uh, express web application that runs ST as the middleware in that specific version, we'd actually be able to access any files that we know their paths to exist on the server. As simple as that. I think part of the vulnerable code is, uh, an important part of it is also learning what is the fix, okay? So, the fix that you know, maintainers have applied in this case has been removing the path normalization to begin as a, first, as a first thing to do, and then instead trying to, I would say, decode it. Might have been a, probably using the decoder has probably been a potentially a better uh, way of doing it. But there are some regexes that essentially try to do the same thing. They try to uh, decode percent encoded characters and then apply the normalization. So the normalization can actually take effect and not be bypassed. So this is the fix. And I think at this point, we're already learning how to get it right. So first off, there's not just using the right APIs, but also the order of the APIs really matter. So first off, you know, you should probably do decoding of the URI, then apply path normalization, and then the further out uh, related functions that, of course, very related to whatever, you know, uh, application logic that you want to apply, whether you want to uh, join it, concatenate it uh, with resolve or something else. And there's a handy function which I haven't seen many people use, that's path.relative, which uh, the idea is, of course, checking that uh, uh, a directory is a relative to a parent one, and that's kind of help you out to understand uh, and ensure that a directory is really a part of a scope that you want to apply as the root of the project. Well, this has been fun, but also beyond NPM, packages being vulnerable, uh, or vulnerable code at Wavy Rewrite, what about path reversal in VS Code extensions? Now, that's, a, that's an interesting story. So let's see an example of where a VS Code extension might be vulnerable to path reversal, and where does that actually meet us? Because that's not any deployed code uh, you know, anywhere in, on production. That's just an extension on my, my IDE and my computer. So <clears throat> essentially, we'll see how this can actually uh, escalate into uh, gaining um, sensitive information from our systems. So here is open in default browser. That's the name of the extension. It's as simple as basically right-clicking any HTML file or whatever, and it will open it in the, in the browser. Um, so it all makes sense. It's a tiny add-on to VS Code, but it is a popular one, right? It's one that gets downloaded about one million times off of the marketplace or installed at this point in time. Uh, but behind the way that this VS Code extension works is the fact that it actually spawns a local HTTP server to serve you with that file that you actually want rendered on the browser. So the Snake Security Research team has actually, uh, last year, uh, did a bunch of research around VS Code extension marketplace and what can we find there. If there's like malicious things, if there are vulnerable things, and you know, what's the extent and the scope of it. And we've actually find that this was vulnerable to path reversal and could be exploited by malicious actors. Let's see how and dive into this. Uh, let's see if I get the video working. Maybe now. Let's see if I can find it on my drive. Right, so let's do something else, which is to play it from my drive.
All right, so what's going on here? So this is a video showing you the exploitation taking uh, place. On the left side of it, you see, of course, um, the IDE working out, and then on the right side, the browser. So I'll take you through it because this is like a very fast-tracked video. Essentially, we're going to uh, have an index file uh, HTML here. Developer does, you know, open in, uh, in default browser like the extension works, and you can see it rendered on the right, so, so far, so good. Now, the attacker opens up three sub-terminals here. One of them is uh, basically showing you how they serve a local file uh, to be available. So you could see that PHP thing running up. Then they use ngrok to serve that file over the network. So you understand this isn't any local attack. This is anyone who's basically able to like send you a link. And at the end of it, on this left side here, uh, I know it's a bit small, but essentially what it shows is the current directory having just two files. So the attack uh, is, comes down to the fact that if I, as an attacker, can send any of you here who use VS Code and have this extension open and installed in their browser, a link to click on, the only, need, the only thing that I need you to do is visit that link. It's basically a zero-click exploit. You just click on it, it opens up, and at that moment, I have access to anything you have on your computer. Let me show you how that works. This is now tricking the user, so for example, a phishing attack that has been, uh, the user has actually been tricked to uh, fix it, which I can easily fool all of you if I'll tell you there's a new runtime that's even 100% faster than Bun, right? Everyone here clicks on it. So you click on it, uh, your browser opens, you see something, maybe it gets closed very fast. I don't know if you caught the fact that the file was automatically downloaded to the server. This is a very kind of like collaborate attack of how this actually works with iframes and cores and stuff like that. But after that, you could see now the files on disk has actually been added. There's now a new keys.txt file, potentially an SSH key that was on your host, and I've now been able to transfer it to mine. The only thing that I needed you to do is have this VS Code extension with a vulnerability exist, running in your VS Code, and get you to visit a link. That's the only thing I needed to do to steal files and credentials from your local development environment. So with that said, getting back to why does this happen? Um, let me go back here. There we go. So why is this happening? Let's look at a vulnerable VS Code extension. Maybe you've already kind of like caught it uh, of what's happening here. Um, kind of highlighting the, the best part of it. <laughs> it's decoding the URL. So if I'm trying to access percent to %e, percent to %e, whatever, and private SSH key on the server, it's getting decoded to the dot, dot slash of it, and then uh, it's getting uh, basically join and concatenated uh, through path resolve to the root path uh, of wherever I work. So for example, for me, it might be slash homely run, slash projects, repos, whatever, over I'm running this farm, and I can essentially access anything. As you can see, there is no validation of whether people should actually access a root files beyond the root path. It's just served as is, okay? So this is why this has been happening. Um, okay, oh, now we have the video. We can skip that. So this is a very, um, I would say a very elaborate attack in the way that it actually works. If you wanna understand all the tidbits and how this zero day exploit works, which is a very, uh, very interesting part of how to combine some HTML tricks and JavaScript tricks uh, to bypass cores and things like that. There's a whole uh, security research done there. Uh, ping me afterwards, I'm happy to share the link too. You can quickly take a picture as well. The thing is, this vulnerability is something that is, this should get this specific issue, all of us here kind of like wor a bit worried about this, right? Why is it? It's because this is happening in VS Code, right? Essentially, there is no one auditing VS Code marketplace extensions. What happens if they have more severe vulnerabilities, which are like more specific, uh, you know, potential malicious packages in there, right? There's no CVE for it which then these two red flags combine, uh, combine together actually uh, address the third flag, which is the fact that, well, there's no alert mechanism. You know, CVEs that we get when we do a sneak test or an NPM audit on the CLI, we get the vulnerability and the CVE. That's a mechanism that is also helpful for you to understand and be alerted that there's like a potential security issue here. There's nothing here that actually checks VS Code extension, and I'm you know, not talking about other extensions, IDEs, different language ecosystems, other places where this is happening. In fact, when we talk about supply chain security, and you hear that term getting thrown around you know, a bunch uh, you know, these days, 
I think to an extent what I'm really worried about is not just you know, the productions and the CIs, and that is all very, very important, but also the fact that we as developers are being actively targeted by malicious actors because of what they can gain if they are able to access our systems, okay? As developers, we may have API keys lying around, we may have you know, that NPM token lying around, they can publish packages for us and do a bunch of really, really, really bad things if they can access our laptops. Well, how about patch reversal in the Node.js runtime? I mean, we've seen it in NPM packages. We see how it can happen in our own code. We've seen it in VS Code extensions. What about the runtime itself? Now, when we update Node because it has incredibly new features that are amazing to update for, you know, for ESM, for watch, for tests, and whatever, this is all really great. And we mostly upgrade probably because of this. But how often do you actually take notice to upgrade because of a new security release that was sent out. And you know, there's a bunch of really smart and hardworking people uh, you know, here in the summit that are working towards making that happen and making those security releases happen. So here is why this is important. A vulnerability in Node.js of, of a specific version has actually is able to lead to a flaw of the, the logic that was applied in one of the PAT core modules. Uh, specifically in a function called normalize string POSIX, which is part of the you know, permutations of different OSs and how they normalize strings. And uh, this isn't supposed to be readable because I wanted to make this complete. This isn't the entire uh, fix that was made to make that uh, vulnerability uh, mitigate. And so you could see how it's not a lot of code, but the subtle dif uh, differences, right, the, the code paths that need to be taken to handle, percent, uh, to handle that, that slash, is, you know, is, is, is very nuanced and it can be mistaken. So specific modules who rely on how this validation actually works would be vulnerable to patch reversal attacks. So how does it look like in practice without not going through the code at this point? So imagine you have this path, you know, data slash food, data slash whatever. What you'd expect from a you know, runtime that's running okay with own vulnerabilities is it actually resolved to this slash etc password path. But the vulnerable version of the node runtime at that point was actually giving you a different result. And if you take that and combine this with other path-related uh, APIs, like path join or path resolve, you can see how uh, an example is given where you could like, you know, serve files from slash public and then normalize the path for it and whatever, which is an okay thing to do after you decode it and whatever. But the runtime you know, doesn't work as expected, and so the expected result is not really what's returned for you. You actually get different uh, results, and then they are served to you. So any logic that tries to also uh, try to contain them doesn't really work well. And this is really only applies to specific uh, modules that use this uh, in the ecosystem. So let's imagine that we have, uh, you know, Express here again for the sake of things, uh, and this, simple express or you know, node application is enough to show you how this actually works. If I, if I simply use uh, the express static one uh, as a middleware to serve uh, static files to my server, you could see like I'm using you know, not vulnerable express version, there's, not, there's no code security issues here, there's no NPM dependency vulnerable here, it's nothing, right? The only thing I need to do is send off a uh, you know, very specialized uh, curl request, an HTTP request to the web server, and I will be able to traverse because of the way that the node uh, runtime is vulnerable, be able to traverse it and actually uh, access this. So I wanted to show you uh, how this actually works in practice. Let's see if the, if the demo here works uh, well. Let's get this one out. All right, so um, hopefully my IP hasn't changed. Let's see. Let's add this one. So we're at 10, 10, 180. Okay, cool. Um, so what we have is, bring that up a bit. So you can see an example of how I dockerized uh, you know, the Node.js runtime in a simple application. This is essentially what it is. And what I wanna show you is there is, there is a tool a fuzzer tool that is called dot dot pun. As you can understand, it's a very kind of like, you know, uh, offensive security tooling that uh, tries to fuzzy test, essentially send a bunch of strings to a server 
and uh, hopefully it finds bad traversal attacks. So don't even need to work really hard. Uh, the funny thing about this tool is it exists since like 2011 or 2012 or something like that and has been shown and showcased at like Black Hat and things like this. It gets a bunch of really, really nice and useful uh, uh, command line flags that you could actually apply and uh, be able to kind of like remove all the false positives. So I could go ahead of, uh, I could go ahead and run it. Uh, this is the command itself. Um, this is the server on running on the on the lefter, and this is on the right to me trying to run this command. It has went through all the presentations. I can see the IP I think is the same, hopefully stay the same. And if I'm ready to launch it, I can press return and it starts and sends all of those strings, right? So like that's gonna take a few minutes. Uh, specifically, this takes five minutes, uh, so I didn't wanna do that. Uh, all of you wait for it, but you can see that when it was done after five uh, minutes and 50, uh, 55 seconds, it had completed and found this kind of URL to be vulnerable. So I can take this URL and apply it here. And there we go, we accessed ETC hosts on my container running a vulnerable node version due to bad traversal. Okay, that's the only thing that needed. We have automated the whole thing, it didn't need to be any smart person, I just Googled, you know, bad traversal fuzzing tools, found it, installed it, whole thing done. So, luckily for us, <laughs> this is back in, this vulnerable version is back in 8.5.0. Um, According to a report that uh, Beth Griggs, uh, which so thankfully have created uh, a while back, uh, the downloads count from the official node uh, kind of like uh, repository, the website thing, uh, say that uh, node eight versions are downloaded about 1.5%. So there are 1.5% versions, uh, 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 stalled versions of, uh, on the internet of this, uh, I, I know if it's 8.5.0, uh, but this specific vulnerability exists and affect that one and there are potentially servers running this and may be vulnerable to it. So this is an important thing, you know, please update. So summarizing with some learnings. Uh, you know, we've seen how path reversal is very, you know, very much everywhere, right? It's like VS Code extensions, dependencies, code, runtimes. I've got examples from routers being vulnerable to, v to path reversal attacks and whatever you can do with those. It's also easy to confuse, right, the nuanced differences between how to use correctly those kind of file path APIs that are very important are you know, not something that we all understand. And it's a doorway in, because I've been showing you that I can access the ETC host file on the container. I can also access you know, package JSON or whatever and then escalate the attack to things that are more uh, impactful. So in, in my opinion, this is kind of like my take of it, kind of like the severity of path reversal vulnerabilities very much compounds with the more insecurely built applications, right? So the more that you, you the, the application itself is built with insecure things, like you store secrets in your file system and stuff like that, this vulnerability compounds to more and more aggressive attack vectors. So I would say, what is the path to no path traversal at this point? Well, obviously, you know, us learning and being more aware of this uh, helps. Um, if I had used, for example, the Sneak uh, VS, uh, VS Code ID extension, which is, you know, which is fully available to install it from the marketplace, what it does is run code security tests on your code. So you can see to the right pane, I've actually went in and uh, used, uh, showed you the ST vulnerable function of getPath. I then copy pasted that into a you know, very vanilla kind of express uh, server and middleware and just put it right there. The moment I pressed command save to save that, the VS Code extension kind of like, you know, went up Sneak scanned the code and told me, hey, you have a vulnerable code there, right, for path reversal attack. So it actually helps you and us as maintainers and as developers of open source packages or at work to really find code security issues. Remember the VS Code Marketplace extension that was vulnerable? Well, we actually ran a, uh, an, uh, a check for that one too. So Kirill was a, a former security uh, researcher at Sneak I've actually cloned that, you know, open and default browser uh, vulnerable version that was, you know, uh, you know subtle to, uh, uh, to uh, susceptible to vulnerable uh, path traversal attacks. He just used the Sneak CLI thing as a quick one, you know, just ran Sneak code test on the code base, and again, ultimately finding uh, path traversal attacks in that. So it actually helps us write secure code and find it. And of course, at the end of it, you know, not everything can be, you know, very well automated. Uh, hopefully, you know, at some point it is. Uh, but you know, putting up resources for all of you, you know, and you being here, learning about uh, path reversal attacks and other security issues in Node is very, very important. So you can just you know, Google sneak learn and learn a bunch of uh, really cool um, um, uh, 
uh, pass through interactive uh, modes and things like that. So with that, I hopefully uh, we're all aware of what patch reversal vulnerabilities are, how they can uh, escalate, and hopefully how to mitigate them. So thank you all very, very much, and hope you enjoy uh, the conference. All right, thank you so much, Liran. That, or Liran, that was a great talk. I really appreciate it. Um, all the talks at this conference have been great. Um, come on up. Next we have Danielle, uh, who's gonna talk about the life and times of a Node.js release. Uh, well, she gets her adapter. Um, I'm gonna talk about one of the funnest things about I'm seeing. I really like to ask people, what's a fun fact about you? Not just for the fun facts, but for the reaction to the question. <laughs> because the reactions I get vary from, uh, to, uh, to <laughs> lots of different reactions, none of which have an answer right off the bat. So if you're ever speaking and I'm emceeing, get ready for that question. <laughs> anyway, um, we're gonna keep working on this adapter. After this, we'll have a 30 minute break. Uh, there will be coffee in the hallway. Uh, I announced the evening plans uh, at the beginning, but if you missed them or if you forgot, there will be a slide at the uh, booth for NodeConf EU that will have all of the details for the dinner. And uh, we have the adapter working, so everybody give a round of applause for Danielle. There we go, okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Danielle. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I just wanna thank the conference organizers. I think I met some of them over there, but can we just like give a round of applause for a really great <laughs> conference? Um, yeah, uh, so let's get started. I'm here to talk about Node.js releases. Uh, first, a little bit about me though. I am, uh, I come from the United States, if you can't tell from my accent. Um, I work at a little cloud provider called AWS. Um, I work on a platform called Amplify, so it's a platform for mobile and front end web developers. Um, you could do a lot of stuff like spin up servers, uh, databases, and host your front end apps there. Um, but that's not the interesting part. Today, I'm here to talk about Node and the work that I do on Node. So another thing that I do is I'm a Node.js releaser. I'm also on the technical steering committee and then I also help with security triaging. So that's why I'm here to talk about releases. Um, so does anybody know at this moment how many uh, supported Node releases are available? You just like shout it out. Great, okay, perfect. So we're gonna talk about that. I heard eight, I heard four, I heard three. There's actually three right now. Um, does anyone know how many releases have been done this year alone in 2020, what year are we in, 2022? Three, no, not three. <laughs> one, no, okay, great. So I'm also gonna talk about why there's many more than three and one. We've done about 30 on the team. Um, I think I counted 32. So yeah, a lot of work, but uh, the reason we do all that work is because we like to make it seamless for the developers like you. Um, so before I get started, I'm just gonna kind of go over the base definitions. What is a release? Um, a release refers to the code changes that have been made um, in the Node.js code base and that those are put onto the release line and then deployed and released in the node binaries. Um, code changes are evaluated by commit and then we use GitHub labels to categorize each of those commits by Semper major, minor, patch, um, and then there's a, other labels as well. Um, a release line refers to the Semper major release um, that is being released and maintained at that time. So we have, um, right now we have 19 that's being worked on, um, 18 is going to go to LTS soon, um, we've had up to five active release lines at a time. Uh, don't ask me how we got there, but right now we're at three, and so we try to keep it three to four. Um, and then I think it was probably COVID related, but. Uh, and so, and then releasers, uh, we're not actually responsible for writing the code that goes into the releases, but we are responsible for making sure that we understand everything that goes in. Uh, we're writing the release notes, we're making sure nothing breaks, testing, et cetera, and then of course, deploying the releases. 
Um, so there's three stages of a release. Uh, we have current, um, so when a, um, a Sember major is released, uh, the, I'm gonna say release a lot, so if I trip over my words, please forgive me. Uh, so a current release is the first six months of that release. It's released, um, it, we try to keep it in sync to the node base branch, which is main. Um, Everything that lands in that branch uh, roughly is what is in main, so you're getting the latest and greatest features. Um, and then, um, but everything, uh, so everything kind of goes in for main, but except for the December major changes, which would go into the next um, release. Uh, the next, so after six months, it goes to active LTS. Um, that's kind of, you're still getting the latest and greatest features, but the changes have already been tested in, you know, in the current release, so they've already tested in the wild, so that anyone that wants maybe a more stable version of Node, they're not just getting, you know, hot off the shelf features. It's already been um, baked for a couple weeks and then we pull it into the active line. Um, and then we have maintenance mode. And so maintenance, we stop bringing in commits from the, um, from the base branch and we actually just start making patches to that release line. So there's security patches that go in, bug fixes. Um, there's, yeah, they, you'd be surprised how many bug fixes and security patches go in. You know, it's for 18 months, so we are maintaining that version, but we wanna make sure that it's still usable because a lot of people are still using it. Um, so this is just a visual of the timeline. So I'm gonna use uh, BR and AR as the rough date. So around three months, oh, and we, we um, they age by months. So you can think of it as like maybe a pet or a child. It kind of just, you know, ages over time and it goes through these life cycle stages. So about three months before the release, I think this is flexible considering, depending on, you know, who's working on it, but um, we start to talk about what's going into the major release, at least on the release team, um, you know, put out the schedule. Uh, at zero, that prepared release goes out, so in a couple weeks, for example, node uh, 19 is going out, so it's like this big, you know, event, there, everyone's talking about the breaking changes, um, and so that's very exciting for everyone in the node community. Um, the next, uh, what happens next? Yeah, so then after that, we move to active LTS. Um, that's six months, and so like I mentioned before, we kind of, whoops, I'm not doing that right now. Oh no, leave me alone, okay. Um, so yeah, so we move to LTS. That's when the, the release line stabilizes and we make sure that we are pulling in um, more stable commits. Um, Odd Semper major releases are deprecated at this point, so they reach end of life, um, and we kind of throw those away, and we don't use them anymore. Um, after 18 months, uh, it's moved to maintenance mode, like I said, and then as all good things do come to an end, uh, after 36 months, roughly, sometimes, you know, this uh, might change, but we the release reaches end of life, so that doesn't mean you can't use it ever. Um, I've gotten this question before. It just means that we're not gonna maintain it anymore. So it's highly, highly recommended that you do move off of end of life versions because um, that you're vulner open to any security vulnerabilities and the Node.js team will not uh, feel bad for you. Okay, so this is like a crazy graph. Um, so basically this is kind of showing the number of commits that go into each release. Um, over time. So you can see I started kind of uh, April of 2020, um, everybody's favorite month, and then um, it kind of ends around now, I think. So uh, you could see like when, um, so let's see, we've got version 14. Version 14, you could see when it was in current, it's roughly around 100 commits per, um, per release. We have, uh, they go out every two weeks, so it's fairly, um, it's a regular cadence, and so everything that's in main goes in. Um, then you can see, uh, once it hits LTS, those releases start to spread out, but it doesn't mean that we have less changes, it just means we have bigger releases, and so we like to give them more time to, um, to test, more, um, more time to kind of evaluate what goes in. So you could see we, we surpassed 200, there's one over there that's over 400, there's one up there that's 600, um, and then we kind of have at the same time, we have another release that comes out. It's doing current, it's every two weeks, roughly 100 commits are released, and then we kind of have the less frequent um, LTS releases. So you could see we had a huge one up there, uh, 700 commits in one release. Uh, 
Um, and then also, yeah, and then we start over again. And then once it hits maintenance mode, then you have commits there, five commits, eight commits. Um, it kind of stabilizes until the release hits end of life. Um, so how do we maintain all of this? Because we do not keep it all in our head. Um, so it's all very Git, um, Git driven. So we have two Git branches per release line. Um, one is the, you could call production uh, branch, and then the other one is the staging branch. So um, the staging branch is the one that we work off of. We might move in commits, backport commits, I'll go into what that means. Um, and then also, and then the production branch is just mirrors what is already been, what is released at that time. Um, so yeah, so we also, I mentioned it a little bit before, so the way that we maintain kind of um, all of these commits across, you know, pulling them in from main, um, is that we use GitHub labels uh, pretty, pretty religiously. So um, there's a lot of trust that's required between a lot of the Node.js uh, contributors and collaborators to make sure that we are uh, labeling changes correctly so that something, you know, that might be a breaking change doesn't go into a patch release or something. That's an extreme example. But um, so we have, sem like I said before, Semper Major, Semper Minor, Semper Patch uh, labels. And then we have a, a wide range of labels, labels that kind of say, okay, like don't land this on, on 14, don't land this on 16, et cetera. Um, so this is just, yeah, another visual, it kind of shows how uh, once each release is, once each December major release is hits its kind of release date, it branches off of main and it's maintained in parallel with main. And so it never comes back, it never diverge, or it's diverged and it never comes back and merges with main. Um, we've done that later with V18. Um, and so the way that works is that with the commits, um, so you could see, so this is an example with what we're diffing between main and um, a current release. So we have commits, the little squares, if you could see those are, are my commits. Um, and so we have moved those into the staging branch. Um, and then at some point we move them into the, um, into the production branch. And then those get updated and everything becomes in sync, but it's still behind main because it's never going to sync to main because main is where the code is and then these are where, where this is where the releases are. Um, so how does that work? Uh, we have some cool, just realized the command might be a little wrong, but that's fine. Um, we have some cool node core tools that we use. Uh, this one takes a branch diff uh, between two Git objects. So you can use commit SHAs, you can use tags, or you can use branch names. Um, takes the, the, um, the diff, um, it lists out all of the SHAs, and then there's a deny list flag that you can use. So this one I just said, Sember Major, obviously we're, we don't want the Sember Major um, commits from main, but you know there's also some other labels that we might add to. And then we just cherry pick. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. So we cherry pick, each one goes on. But what happens when you cherry pick, um, you have probably have some merge conflicts. So I'll talk about how we deal with that. Um, let's see, so yeah. So there might be hundreds of commits that we go through. So we don't actually do them by hand, one by one. Um, we can't automate everything because of those merge conflicts, um, because there does need to be a human kind of looking at that and saying, okay, uh, you know, can I resolve this? Should I ask for a backport PR? Um, and then there, that human also needs to be there to keep track of that and drop those commits. Um, we can't automate that yet, but hopefully that will, I don't know if anyone from GitHub is here, please let them know that's what we're looking for. Um, so what is a backport PR? Uh, so when we are working on the, um, the releases and something doesn't land correctly, um, we'll ask for a backport PR and that's just a pull request or a commit that has made it onto main that when it landed on a staging branch, it doesn't pass the test, it breaks the build, it causes um, uh, too many merge commit or merge conflicts. So, you know, it depending on, uh, you know, maybe how many merge conflicts we've run into in that release. If it's the first one, maybe I would sit there and say, okay, yeah, this looks fine. But if it's the 10th one in the release, I'm probably just gonna say, I don't wanna deal with this. Whoever is the author, please open a backport PR. Um, it just helps us so much. Um, so this is the 
command that we use um, to kind of automate. <laughs> um, we, uh, yeah, so you just get the same list of commits um, and it pipes it to cherry pick and so it goes through and um, adds all of the commits to the staging branch. Um, and then we run a local test. So what make test does on the Node.js code base, it will um, build a local binary for you to use, um, just a node binary, and then you can run all of your tests on it. Um, so we're done, right? We're ready to release. No, test run, always fails, um, so there's a ton of work that comes after this now. So, um, so the way that uh, we now need to figure out where like this breaking changes or whether the, where the several breaking changes is we have to divide and conquer. So um, we use git bisect, um, which for anyone that doesn't know is a divide and conquer, well, uses a divide and conquer algorithm, which is dependent on um, a sequential set of, of objects. So for instance, um, git shahs, they go in order because git is a um, sequential log of changes. And so we take the first commit, which we know is the failing one. We take the last one, which this one we points to the, um, uh, this one could be one that we know that is passing, or it could be the last commit on a, um, on the last release from the staging branch, and then we start a git bisect. And so it partitions the list of SHAs. We see what, depending on that middle commit, did that commit pass or did that commit fail? And then it takes the, you know, the right or left side and says, okay, and then we recursively go through and look for the offending commit. Um, so we do this, um, we go through the git bisect, uh, and then we find the offending commit. And so, are we done now? All right, so we have to do an interactive rebase. Uh, we'll drop the commits, um, commit, uh, and then we run and make test to see if it works. And does it work? No. Uh, usually we have to do this several times because there's lots of uh, bugs that might come up once we take out um, a commit, so for instance, if I have like in main, if I have a commit that is changing a lot of files and then suddenly I have a lot of um, other commits that are kind of built on top of that, I drop one commit, I try to resolve it, but now all of those um, future commits are all dependent on this functionality. So we have to go back, bisect again, rebase, and do that over and over again until we have a passing build and passing tests. So we're ready to go. Um, so next, uh, the next steps are preparing the release. So we write the release nodes. Um, we have another node core um, uh, tool that we use uh, that generates the release nodes really nicely. So um, we just have to, again, hand it a git object and then it'll generate kind of the diff of the, of the uh, of the commits so that we can add them to the release nodes. And then again, like a human has to go in there, update the release node so that there's some you know, notable changes so that uh, the developers that are reading the release nodes can see, okay, this is what I need to look out for. This is, you know, these are the new features. This is how they work. This is the new APIs. So um, if you're interested in what's going out, uh, there's pull requests that get open too. So, in order to you know, circulate the pull request, we propose it on um, GitHub. Every person that uh, opens a pull request, we try to you know, do the pull request uh, you know, rules or whatever, um, you know, give it 48 hours, um, have at least two, um, two reviewers. Uh, yeah, and I try to, you know, people that have made like major changes in that release, I try to, you know, we try to get them in and say, hey, can you, do you have any like thoughts on, on this? Can you um, come up with, is there anything, you know, that we need to add to the release notes? Um, this pulled request doesn't have very good release notes, but usually that's what we try to do. And then we run the CI test. So um, I already mentioned I, we run tests locally that create the build, but that's just one, um, machine. I have, a la I have a Mac. Not everyone has a Mac. I don't think anyone's using Macs in the cloud. So, you know, we have to run tests on a bunch of different supported architectures and operating systems um, to make sure that everything's passing and there's no, you know, crazy aggression, um, regressions across any sort of um, platform. Uh, the next thing we do also is we test with the ecosystem. So, if you've ever seen the acronym SITGYM, S 
no, can't even spell it, C-I, TGM, um, anywhere in the node code base, that's referring to the tests that are run across the um, Node.js ecosystem. So we have all a bunch of popular packages, we run their test suites against the new um, package, or the new, like the newly built binary. Uh, we look for any regressions, anything that might pop up that might, um, you know, that could be disruptive to the ecosystem because the last thing we want to do is release something that breaks a bunch of packages. You know, we don't really have Node if we don't have uh, packages and Node modules, I think. Um, okay, so while we're working on this, I just want to address the security patches. So we're doing all of this in public, so how do we address any um, security reports? Node is a pretty big project. We do get a substantial amount of, um, you know, security researcher um, inquiries, and so we try to address those and then um, in a timely fashion also patch those. And so that all happens um, pretty much in the same way, but just in private. So. Uh, there's a lot of coordination that goes into that because um, the wording has to be very specific. Um, you know, we want to make sure that when we do release those security patches that the, um, the developers that receive that, they really understand the severity, if it'll address, um, if it will affect them, and then also how they, they would fix that in their code base. Um, so yeah, we do everything in private, um, the testing, the reviewing, um, and then we release and we make the vulnerability public and hopefully everybody upgrades. Um, so the last step is building out that release. Um, we create the builds, this is, this is the easy part because we just throw everything at CI, we create builds, um, we tag the release on GitHub and then we promote and sign the releases. So every releaser has a GPG key that has been made public. Uh, we sign those binaries, we upload them with a Shawsome uh, file you pull those, you download um, those binaries with the SHA sum and you can verify with everybody's GPG key and you could see, oh, this person, they made this release, that's the person that signed this binary, great, it's verified, I'm safe. Um, so now that, it, <clears throat> excuse me, so now that I've released, uh, what comes next? Well, I know for me, I never stop thinking about what is what's coming up next. So I finished a release and I have a couple more scheduled. We schedule releases months in advance and years in advance. And that's because we do have kind of a robust schedule. Um, and so we want to make sure that we have enough people to cover all of those, um, the code names. Those are all kind of scheduled ahead. So um, right now I think we're up to through 2026. Um, assuming that we do uh, keep with the same code names through Q and W, we still don't have names for those, so if you have any ideas, um, please open, I broke pull request, but please open an issue if you have any clever ideas, because uh, that's definitely something that we, um, we've discussed. Um, and then so, this is a lot of work to do. Um, what is our, how does our velocity look like? So I mentioned how many releases we got out this year. This is just the number of releases that the release team has done since April of 2020 when I kind of pulled all of this data. Um, I think this is roughly over 100 releases. I think I counted 112. So as you can see, um, we have the two kind of uh, odd numbers. Those, they reached end of life. I think. I don't remember how many exactly they were, but you could see it's between 10 and 20. Um, and then we kind of have a nice, uh, you know, slope for, okay, we have our maintenance, we have our um, LTS active, and then we have current. And so that, those will slowly grow as we progress in time. And so I would say that um, given all of the kind of work that we have to do, I'd say the velocity is pretty good considering we've, you know, there's over 100 releases have been able to be put out in the past two and a half years. Um, and so does all this craziness really <laughs> benefit developers? I think it does. Um, some developers, whoops. Um, some developers might not want the latest and greatest features. Um, they can only have the capacity to upgrade every year, maybe every two years. So we don't want to be, have everybody just sticking to, okay, everyone has to take what is in um, the base branch of Node. And so we also have we have that current release for people to get the latest and greatest features, but that's why we keep maintenance around for so long because not everyone can upgrade. You know, there's a lot of cloud providers as, as well. They are trying, you know, they, they want to make sure that their platforms are also, um, you know, uh, 
supporting these, these versions in the way that they want to. So, you know, they're a little slower to adapt. Um, yeah, so, and I think that this model really helps um, accommodate a wide range of developers um, because, you know, Node is a very large ecosystem and so we want to make sure that we accommodate everybody. Um, what are we doing on time? All right, I have one and a half minutes left. So, if you have any questions about release, um, these links, I'll put this on, um, put this online. These are, it's a very long link, so I don't expect anyone to remember that, but this is just the release guides. If you're interested, there's a whole um, uh, run book for how we do releases, and then also the release working group link. So if you're interested, you know, please reach out to me or any other releasers. They're all scattered about here. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thank you all for listening to me. I hope you have a great rest of your conference. Thanks. Great job. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danielle. It was really great to get uh, kind of a look at the internals of how releases work. I, I found it really interesting. Uh, we are now on a break until 11 o'clock. Uh, there, if you're, there are any runners here. Um, there is tomorrow a planned run around the Lyrith estate. Uh, they will be meeting in the lobby at 7:25. Um, there's more details on Twitter. I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll retweet it, and I'll, uh, hopefully the conference will as well. So if you're a runner and you're interested in running around the estate, um, you know, just uh, yeah. All right, have a great break.
All right, it is a little past 11, uh, so we've let all the, you know, uh, hopefully we've got coffee in our system or tea or whatever your drink of choice is and we're staying hydrated because it is humid out here. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> but anyway, uh, now we've got Luke who's going to talk about a journey into mystery. Luke's fun fact actually involves me. Um, I gave a talk at Empire JS back in 2013 about the beagle bone and using JavaScript to control RGB LEDs. And I actually inspired Luke to buy a beagle bone and blink in LED and JavaScript. So um, yay, JavaScript hardware. Um, all right, so give it up for Luke. Need some hydration first, hold on. Gotta stay hydrated. All right, let's see, let's try the clicker. All right, yeah, so uh, a little bit about me, my name is, hi, I'm Luke, and you wouldn't know to look at me, but I can run really fast. So, uh, Also, I, I work at Red Hat, um, where I work on node-related items and, and such. Um, I'm also American, based on my accent. Hopefully you can tell that. I'm not, I am Swedish, but I do not hail from Sweden, if you were hoping for somebody from a, with a Swedish accent. Um, I am 5'7", which is roughly about, what I say, uh, 170 centimeters, just for those who, you know, want to know, based on me being on stage here. Um, <laughs> I also put a picture of myself up here so everybody in the back can see what I look like 15 years ago. Um, I, I guess I don't take pictures of myself, so this is, this is it right here. Um, this is what I look like now. Um, <laughs> Right, so you can follow me on Twitter at Sienna Luke. Um, I usually tweet about like Node-related stuff. Usually retweets. I don't usually tweet too much about, you know, my own personal stuff. Um, I also like and retweet various kind of Marvel and C um, Seinfeld and Star Wars and those various those various things that are that are you know my interests. Also, a very very large Star Wars nerd, um, especially with the old trilogy. And um, so if you want to talk some Star Wars, you know, come, come see me later. I also have this little Yoda figure um, that comes with me on all my talks and stuff. This is 1980 original right here, the year I was born. Um, so yes, yes, that makes me 42. I am quite old, I guess, compared to maybe the crowd. I don't know. I, don't, I, I haven't taken a poll, so I'm not really sure. All right, so that's about me. Um, so I do want to first, first thank uh, my family. Um, because me being here definitely disrupts our day-to-day -day at home. Um, you know, so here we, have, here we have Gabe, and then Graham is on the other side. That's uh, Jasper. That's our new addition, our bearded dragon. That's actually Gabe's uh, pet. Um, and then Chewy, all the way on the end there. Uh, yes, my dog's name is Chewbacca. Um, but I also want to thank specifically my wife, because she is handling all the child care right now that... I usually do, you know, bring kids to school and making lunches and all this stuff. So, can we please give a big round of applause for my wife, Mary? Okay, that's, that's good. That's good. A little weak, but whatever. Um, all right. Yeah. So, uh, so right. The talk's called "Journey into Mystery," and if you are a comic book fan, you will know that uh, "Journey into Mystery" was the first, um, the first appearance of Thor and Loki. Um, not in the same issue, two different issues. Um, so this is actually, you know, a big ruse to actually talk about those characters instead of what I wrote on the, the abstract. Actually, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so it's called Journey into Mystery. You know, when I say Journey into Mystery, I'm talking about um, those things that exist in Node, in Node that we might not have ever experienced, but they're there, they're just existing, waiting for someone to use them. And which makes me think of this kind of this great quote here. It's uh, sometimes tiny doors lead to big opportunities. Um, anybody know who, who may have said this quote? Anybody? No? No? OK. I'll give you a second. What was that? No. Uh, not really close. Uh, if you said Lisa Simpson's cat Snowball 2, you would be correct. So in case anybody is a Simpsons fan, that's, that's for you guys. Um, God damn. Um, right, so I took some inspiration from a couple of videos that I watched when I was doing mobile web about 10 years ago. Um, 
And these were these two, um, you know, uh, videos that are now like 12 years old uh, from Paul Irish called 10 Things I Learned from jQuery Source, and then the follow-up, 11 More Things I Learned from the jQuery Source. You all remember jQuery out there, right? So this, this was a big, this, these were big videos back in, you know, 2010 or whatever, whatever that was. Um, yeah, so if you want to check them out, they're, they're pretty cool. If you wanted to know about jQuery, you just Google them or whatever. Right, so just small, okay, yeah, it's two Simpsons uh, references and two slides, so I don't know if I do anymore, but. Um, <laughs> right, so a quick disclaimer about, about this talk. Um, I definitely don't pretend to be an expert in, in all this stuff and all Node-related items. You know, Node is huge. Um, but there are various things that I do have my finger on the pulse. There's, there's a pulse out there, and I have a finger on that pulse, possibly. Um, so, you know, some of, the, some of the modules and the concepts and the APIs that I go over, um, you know, they might be familiar to you, and that's cool, you know, whatever. You know, may not, but it might not be familiar to other folks that are maybe newer to Node and that kind of stuff. So my goal is really kind of the 80%, 20% model where, you know, um, you know, and the structure of this talk should go, and I'm not sure if it does, uh, from things that are more well-known to the things that are lesser known uh, in known core. Um, I'm just reading my notes here, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, and I also had to, um, so I was going, as I was going through the talk, I actually had to cut a bunch of things out due to kind of the time constraints. So, you know, maybe next year we could do a part two, you know. Somebody's yeah. laughing over there, that's great. Um, right, so, uh, you know, if there's things that I don't mention, and there's, th you know, and you're like, oh, I've used this before, and you haven't mentioned it, you know, you can just, you know, send me a tweet on Twitter or whatever. Um, you know, it's Santa Luke, again, um, and uh, maybe we can have a discussion there, right? So that's my secret secret way of getting followers is to is to say that. All right. So uh, with the disclaimer out of the way, uh, let's uh, let's go and see what uh, what are some of the um, more common modules first before we get into the into the things. So some of the things that you might know, right? So modules, and this is just a little smattering of things. So like the file system module or path, um, you know, file system doing the, the input output, you know, read, write, and all that stuff, and then path is, kind of goes along with that. Um, you know, you, you have your HTTP module, which you know you probably don't use directly. You're using that behind like Express or like a Fastify or some other other framework, but it's there, it's, it's very common. I, I would hope people know about that. If not, don't worry. Uh, there's the child process, um, you know, that's for executing, you know, kind of random code, I guess. Uh, and then we can't forget events because, you know, Node is a event-driven framework, or so, of course, we need events there. Uh, as for APIs, here's just a few of ones that I thought were, um, Kind of more common, uh, like you know, like the two process ones, like EMV and you know, and CDW, getting the uh, you know the current working directory or getting your environment variables from that that you're passing in. Um, I put the the util that promiseify on there and the util that callbackify, which I don't use the callbackify, but the promiseify I've used quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm a real big fan of promises. Um, so if these are new to you, don't worry, you know, it's fine. Uh, and then I put my, my very personal favorite one at the very bottom, which is console log. You know, I'm, I am a console log debugger. I'm sure many of you, show of hands, who are, who are console log debuggers out there? Yeah, okay, all right. Props to console.log, yeah, love it, love it. All right, so uh, let's, let's, let's start here. So the first thing we're gonna do here is kind of look at this, it's not really a module per se, it's, it's globals, right? So you have these, these five things. Um, you know, and they're in, and you know, all these are in every single module that you that you would work with, but they're not actually they're not actually globals. Um, Node adds this uh, this this wrapper here to every module that it calls, um, where it you know, and and so all those things are basically scoped to that one particular module. So they aren't actually globals. Um, you know it. The reason why they do this, according to the docs, um, you know, it's, it keeps variables that we define with var, const, and let, 
uh, scope to the module rather than the global object, which is great because you don't want to pop, you know, you know, pollute the global object. That's why I'm not a big fan of Jest. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> um, you know, and it also provides some, and this is, and this is verbatim from the docs, and I'm not really sure I like the, the, the whatever on this, but it says it helps provide some global looking variables that are actually specific to the module, such as the module and export objects that Node can use to export values from the module. And uh, the convenience variable is a file name, that's a underscore underscore. I don't know if you can tell based on that, it just looks like one line based on the font. Uh, and then the directory name, and that contains the module's absolute file name and directory path, right? Um, and also, I just want to quickly mention that this is for CommonJS, and uh, you know, for ES modules, well, yeah, I'm just I'm going to leave that alone because, yeah, ES modules, not a big fan, and I'm not going to start a flame war here. All right, so uh, so the next thing up is this Node Prefix concept. Right, so while this is not a module itself, it is, you know, a kind of important concept here. So as it turns out, all the core modules in Node, you can prefix. Um, so, like, you know, like you can do, you can require, you know, Node FS or Node Assert, for instance. Um, you know, and why would you do this if it's just going to be more verbose, right? Um, but the, kind of the trade-off here is that, you know, it, makes it so it's explicit that a module is coming from node core. And, you know, and tooling can check this out, and if your user coming in looking at code, you, you can look at this and be like, oh, this module is coming from node core and not from user land, right? So, you know, we saw, um, I'm sort of taking this a little bit from uh, Liz's talk yesterday where she had mentioned the test runner that came in node. Um, and, and this, isn't, this isn't, isn't necessarily the example that she used, but it's sort of similar where, she's requ where we're requiring you know, no tests and no assert and doing a test. Um, you know, what, you know, and so the test runner actually is prefix only. So, you can, so if you were to do this here uh, and require assert, that would work. But if you were to just require tests without the prefix, that would actually not work because Node is now looking for a, uh, a user module called test that you may or may not have installed. So we're gonna don't do that. So if you're gonna use the test runner, you have to use it as a prefix. And at the moment, that's the only one. Um, I'm not sure if there's gonna be more, but for now, that is, that is the only uh, node prefix module that you have to use. All right, go there. All right, next up we're gonna talk about is, uh, is core pack. So this is a thing that uh, was added in Node 16. It looks like it's backported to Node 14.19, whatever the latest version of that is. Uh, it's currently marked as experimental. Um, it is, um, you know, it's an experimental tool that helps in managing versions of your package managers. Um, so basically what it does is it exposes these binary proxies for each supported package manager. Um, and, those, and those supported ones are Yarn, and PNPM at the moment. Uh, so when you call, when you call those, um, it'll identify whatever package manager is configured for the current project, transparently install it if needed, and finally run it without requiring explicit user action. So basically what that means, it allows you to use Yarn or PNNPM, which is a very tough thing to say, um, without actually installing them, right? So just like what currently happens with NPM, which as we know is shipped with Node. Um, and since it is currently marked as experimental, it has to be enabled by default. It's not enabled by default, so you have to enable it, and you would do core pack enable here. Um, yep, and, then, and then once you run core pack enable, it'll set up all the symlinks in your environment next to the node binary, and yeah, and then from that point on, you know, any call to the supported binary like Yarn or the other one that I can't say very well, uh, just work, you know, just work fine. Um, you know, here is sort of, this was on my laptop um, last night actually going through to, to show. So, you know, it, it, core pack comes with the version of Node, so I did, you know, which core pack, and here it is. It's in the, the, the bin directory of my Node installation. As you can see, I'm using NVM for my Node versioning, uh, which I hope all you are too. Um, not necessary, but it's fun. 
Um, so then you do a core pack enable, and then here I'm just saying, you know, where's my yarn and where's my PN and PM, and it's showing that they are installed in the bin directory, kind of next to where the no binary would be there. And then they're ready for use. Um, there's another way that you can specify which manager and version you want to use, and this is the package manager field, which is in the package JSON. This is also an experimental feature. Um, you know, if, it, if, the, uh, if the package manager, uh, the, yeah, the package manager field um, stuff corresponds to the relevant binaries, uh, then it will download it on request and, you know, and then start working. And then say you want to, so I'm sure there's people out there like, what, what about yarn and it? If, you know, what, what do I do about that? So if you want to make sure that the global yarn is a particular version, uh, you can do this prepare statement and you could say, you know, yarn at the particular version and you activate it. Um, yeah, so that's four, I realize there's four slides in core pack and, and I'm not even a big fan of yarn, so that's, that's actually the last slide. All right, so the next, next module here is something that uh, I was a little hesitant to put in because uh, I thought maybe it was a common thing, uh, but we'll just go with it anyway. So query string, right? So, you know, it's for parsing and formatting URL strings. Um, it is marked as legacy, um, and so they do want you to, in the docs, they do want you to start using this URL search, par search params. Um, you know, I, I said I was hesitant to put it in, but I'm assuming most people use this QS module based on the amount of downloads. I mean, it's got a, a shit ton of downloads, and a shit ton is defined as seven, more than 71 million here. Um, so. That's sort of the reason why I put it, because I'm sure most people are using the QS module based on this, this download thing. Okay, so list of built-ins here. So have you ever wanted to you know, know if a module is a built-in core module, right? So you know, you know, I'm sure my, my workflow is I go to NPM, I type in what I'm looking for, and I say, oh, there's a module there, so maybe I'll use it, right? And in this case, there are, there's, there's two. Um, you know, there's a built-in module, and then its dependency is built-in module also goes with that. Um, actually, I think it's switched around. Its built-in module depends on built-in modules, but whatever. But as you can see there, um, it's actually just a static list that's being, you know, that, that's there, that's being output when you, when you do the, that particular uh, module, uh, which is not great. I'm not big on, you know, kind of hard coding stuff. It would be, it would be nice to, to, to run, be able to run a, to be able to run a function that gives me up to date information, right? So there are uh, some options in Node Core. Um, I'm gonna there, first in the REPL module. There's this REPL built in modules, which was added in Node 14.5.0. Um, I also wanted to add, for completeness sake, this uh, this private method, which is now actually deprecated. Uh, this REPL underscore built in libs. Uh, and then in the module, uh, module, um, you know, there is the module that built in modules, and there is the module that is built in, which is added recently in node 18.6.0. Uh, so you can use those instead of the, uh, those NPM packages. Next up is console.table. It is, I know we all know console.log, love it. Um, but this is a little handy little, little function here on, uh, and I say API and function, I'm gonna use those interchangeably, um, so don't at me. Um, so yeah, so this is something where, you know, it takes a bunch of tabular data and it outputs it into this cool little, neat little table, right? It's, uh, you know, you could use it for debugging, you could use it for, maybe you have a CLI that has some data that you wanna kind of show in a table format, this would, this could be an option. Um, right, uh, so, um, seeing what, yeah, so in Node 10 it was added. Uh, it's been around definitely for a few years, but I always seem to forget about it. Um, you know, if you ever worked also in the uh, Chrome inspector, you can also do it there as well. Um, but it's a nice little thing, nice little tool. Right, so uh, let's talk about some command line options here. So, now, first of all, actually, so I should say, first of all, there are a ton of command line options, and if I were to put them all on the slides, it would be like multiple slides, and you know, if you want to look at them, I, I definitely encourage you to go check it out 
you know, on the docs. And there's just a ton of them. But the ones we're gonna talk about today are this pending deprecation one. Um, so pending deprecation is similar to runtime deprecations, but however, if something is labeled as a pending deprecation, it won't actually, and you, um, and you run it, say if you have a, you know, say if you're running some code that, has, that is labeled as pending deprecation, but you don't use the flag, it won't, it'll just out, it won't output anything. It won't output that it's, it's a deprecation. So you would have to use the pending deprecation to see that kind of warning message. And then there's this other one called throw deprecation, which you could imagine, uh, you know, throws an error when you have a deprecation. Um, so, you know, with those two combined, you can do some pretty, inter pretty interesting stuff here. And I am going to try a live demo, which I haven't tried in about five years, so please bear with me. Okay, I go here, go to my terminal. All right, so what we're gonna do is, oh, no, I'm gonna, yes, I use Sublime Text because Sublime Text is awesome. Let's move this over here, just to show you what the code looks like. Okay, so that is not what I'm, okay. So here's, I have this pending deprecation JS file. Um, you know, I'm requiring the REPL, and then I'm also, I'm just console out logging. Um, you know, we're just gonna do the length. Uh, we'll, just, we'll keep it like that. Um, you know, and as I said before, this module, this function right here is deprecated. It's actually labeled as pending deprecation if you look into the docs. Uh, so let's go to the terminal here. If we run that just by itself, right, we'll get the list of modules here, all right? No, and there's no, there's no warnings or anything like that. So if we run it again and we use the command line flag pending deprecation, so weird having to look at that and type over, ah, whatever. Uh, pending deprecation, there's a space there, yep. Okay, so we get the list, but we also get this warning at the bottom saying, hey, you know, this is deprecated, you know, check out this other module instead and stuff. So, which is cool, because then you can, this is sort of like, you know, an early warning sign if you're using, you know, you can put this maybe in your CI or something like that, and if you have modules or have APIs that you're using that have been deprecated, you can start to kind of get these early warnings that, hey, this is deprecated, you might want to change it. Um, but the other thing you can do, and if you combine the two, like this, throw deprecation. Oh, did I type that wrong? Yeah, probably. Deprecate. I'm not the greatest speller. There we go. So now it will throw the warning, but it will also throw the deprecation and exit out of the application. So if you were to do, yeah, so adding, having those two together in your CI, you know, you can have your CI fail because there are maybe pending deprecations, um, and uh, and then you you'll fix them and you, know, you do all that. That's the whole process that you can do. But pretty cool, like little kind of you know if those two together, you can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, I guess while we're at this demo here, um, let's go back to here, you know, and let's take, and I showed you the console table, but let's, let's take a look if we put, if we do this with console table, because this does return an array. Um, so we do that, boom, and then we say node, and we'll just do node, um, adapt. and then here's what the table will look like. Not very great, but you know, there's an index column and there's values. If it was bigger, obviously it would be a lot cooler. All right. So, I think that was the only demo of it. Uh, go back to the slides. Wherever you may be, slides, where are you? Close you. There we go. Okay, demo, done, boom. Okay, so the next module that we're gonna kinda go over here is the VM module. It's you know, it's one of those things that's there. Um, you know, and this allows us to, um, you know, allows us to run code within a V8 virtual machine, you know, with, a with, a, with its own particular context, right? So, you know, if we, look, if we look at this example, 
you know, we're, we're declaring x is equals one in the very beginning. We're, we're declaring a context saying x is equal to in this, in this object. You know, we're creating a context based on that context object we just did. Um, and then here we're writing a little bit of code where x is gonna be plus equal to 40, and uh, then this y is just gonna equal, equal to 17, right? So if we, run, if we run that code in the context with the context that we just created, uh, we see that um, you know, the answer for what well, context x is is 42 because we know that you know, 2 plus 40 is 42. Um, you guys can check that on your calculator if you want to, just, just in case. Um, and then y here was not unchanged because it was 17. So, but then if we console out um, this x variable from the very top, it should be 1 because it is in a different context. Uh, and then y is not defined in this particular case. Um, however, it does say in the documentation that this is not a security mechanism. So do not use it with untrusted code. And I put it on its own slide because it's very important. All right. And uh, I did get a quote from an anonymous uh, node contributor of, yeah, it sucks. But you want to be anonymous, right? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, Right, yeah, so, yeah, so, so be careful when you're using it, and you know, it's not, definitely not a security mechanism. You can do some neat stuff with it, but you know, don't, don't run on trusted code. And this last one is kind of the reason why I actually did the talk here. Um, as I was going through the docs, I saw this, and I was like, what in the hell is this puny code, or, or punny code maybe? I don't know. English is very hard. I'm a native speaker, it's still hard. Um, I like to call it punny code because I like puns but I'm sure it's puny code, I don't know. So, um, but however, you know, before I get any well actuallys from any bros out there, yeah, it's deprecated. And it's been deprecated for a while and it's going to be removed um, at some point. But I guess while we're here, we might as well just talk about it, right? So what does it do? It's a, it's a char character encoding for, for international domains. Um, you know, the, um, it, the, the, the module is a character encoding scheme defined by this RFC, um, and it's prim primarily intended for use in international domain, in international domain names. Uh, because host names and URLs are limited to ASCII characters only, uh, domain names that contain non-ASCII characters must be converted into the ASCII um, version using the, the, the puny code, um, the schema. Um, this, this puny code thing is actually, um, is actually a bundled in from a user land code, and it was just it was just uh, you know exposed to Node as a convenience. I'd be interesting to see what the reason was why this was put in in the beginning, even though now that they're taking it out, and just kind of directing you to use the user land version. That could be that could be your homework, you know, if you want. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that's the end of this this talk here. You know, I there was there was a few there's a there was a lot of things that I had to cut out based due to the time constraints. Um, you know, so maybe next year we can do a part two or something. <laughs> Note conf, except my talk. Um, right. So and then just to just to one more end here. Um, at four o'clock today, we're having this. Uh, me and my other colleagues here are having uh, this workshop. So if you want to check it out, you know, and uh, not to brag or anything, but the uh, recipient of the uh, Node.js Unsung Hero Award from OpenJS World in Austin will possibly be there signing autographs and taking pictures. So maybe get there early. All right, that's my time. Thank you. All right. Come on up. All right, wonderful talk. Uh, I learned some new things. Uh, that was really great, Luke. So now we've got Miroslav, who's going to talk about hold my context. His fun fact, when he went back for his master's degree in computer science, you didn't uh, qualify in computer science, you qualified in math, right? Yeah, so uh, just goes to show that academia does not always <laughs> tell you what you're good at. So all right, let's give it up for Miroslav.
And, and even good interviewers, sometimes they So, as the popular saying goes, context is everything. And without context, you don't know what subset of data your user is allowed to access in your database. You don't know which API endpoint is triggering that slow SQL query that you are seeing in your logs. And finally, when you find an error in your logs, you don't know what was the API you called at the beginning that eventually failed with this error. My name is Miroslav Bajtoš, and today I will tell you how you can work with context in your Node.js applications and how we can propagate it through your code. Before I begin, a quick introduction. I'm working for Protocol Labs, building a decentralized CDN I joined recently. I came from lovely Czech Republic. Hello, all other people out there from Czech Republic as well. And in the past, you might know me from uh, my work done at Strong Group at IBM. I was maintaining Node Inspector in Node.js.10 days, long time ago. I was leading development of Loopback, which is an REST API and ORM framework for Node.js, and I had some uh, contributions to Node.js core as well. For example, async stack traces in the debugger. That was a fun task to work on. Okay, so context. Uh, what, is, what is it, context propagation? What does, what, does, what does it mean when I say context propagation? And I would like to explain this on a simple example. Let's say you are building a REST API server, which will get some data from your database, and then augment this data with some additional information by calling your backend API service, and then finally you return back your response. And if I was writing this in 2013 using Express, I would write a route, get products, and in the implementation I can call my database to get some data, and then I can call my backend services to get some more data, and then finally build the response. And even in a short code like this, there is a lot of context hidden and maybe visible under the hood. So, for example, there is a group of values which we have, which I, which I call application context. For example, correlation ID. This is a request header which you usually want to forward in your calls to backend microservices and you want to print it in your log lines so that when you aggregate log lines from all different parts of your system, you can group together lines for the single request you are troubleshooting. But then there is also user authentication, the user credentials, which you might want to forward to your backend services as well. And then user permissions, what, what data is the user allowed to access, you might want to apply this when querying your database. And this is kind of like high level, which you can see in your code. But there is also what I call implicit context, and these are things which are not so visible but they are important as well. So for example, the fact that our query products function was called from list products, you can see it when you read the code, but at runtime it's not so clear because there are asynchronous uh, operations involved. And similarly, get ratings was called from the query products callback. And now if we step a little bit farther from this, there is also very interesting information that the get products handler trigger the SQL query select all from products, and if you ever troubleshooted performance issues in production, you probably see a problem there. And it's useful to know that this query was called from your slash product handler because it makes it easier for you to find the place in your code which to fix. And then similarly, the same uh, API handler triggered an HTTP call to your backend microservice. And this is typically used by uh, performance monitoring tools which can visualize all of this for you if they have the contextual information needed. Now, if I was using Java or .NET or like Perl, CGI scripts, whatever, I would have much easier life because in these older frameworks there was thread per request model. So for each incoming request, we would start a new thread. In, the, in this thread, we will do our, our business logic and then uh, return back a response. And it's all nicely contained in a single thread. So I can use what's called thread local storage which is a small error in memory dedicated for each thread. And whenever I write data there or read it from there, it will be always scoped to my single thread. So when I'm accepting an incoming request, I can extract the correlation ID, store it in my thread local storage. And then later on, when I'm making the database query, I can, or maybe uh, uh, making a backend API call, I can get the correlation ID from my thread local storage and forward it to the backend microservice. Very easy. Unfortunately, this doesn't work in Node.js, because in Node.js we have a 
the concept of event loop, which is running in a single thread and handling all requests in this single thread. And the pieces and bits of your code, which are executed for your request, are interleaved. So for example, we start by handling our first request, then we do the database query, and while we are waiting for the database to respond, we can start processing the second incoming request. By the time the second handler started the database query, maybe the first database query is done, so we can continue with handling the first request, and so on. And this is great for performance. We can use a single thread to handle many incoming requests in, in parallel. But it doesn't work with thread local storage because there is single storage shared by all threads. So if I store my correlation ID for the second request in my thread local storage, by the time I want to pick it up, it has been overwritten by the second request handler. So that's not what we want. And this problem has been around for, for years and there were many different attempts to solve it. So the very first one, which I would like to mention, is called domains. Domains were introduced, it was a built-in module in Node.js Core, and their goal was to understand all this asynchronous operation, how they are connected together, and the idea was to allow you to return back, back a nice error message when something went wrong in your application. By default, your application crashes, the TCP connection is terminated, there is no response. With domains, you can send back a nice HTTP error response. And it turns out the concepts introduced by domains are quite useful, also for context propagation, that's why I'd like to show it here. And the idea, oh, the idea is uh, simple. You create a domain, which is some sort of a scope, and then you run your request handling code inside this scope. And you also need to attach your event, event emitters to this scope so that the context propagation works, basically. And using the ideas in domains, somebody built continuation local storage, which was a userland module. It offered uh, API for storing and retrieving data. It's a little bit more complex. Let me quickly walk you through this example. First, we create a namespace, and this is for namespacing keys. So if you have different NPM modules and each of them wants to use continuation local storage, they have a safe way how to have unique keys. And then in your server code, you need to run your server handler inside a scope of a continuation local storage. So you run your code in a, you create a new scope, run your code as a callback. And again, we need to bind our request and response to our request context so that everything works. And then finally, we call our handler request, our request handler. And with this setup in place, everywhere else in our code, we can very easily access our per request context, per request data using uh, the, the namespace object and uh, there are APIs similar to map API so you can set and get values. And this is all great, except it doesn't work always. And there are two situations which you can encounter. The first one is that context is lost, context is undefined, your application might crash because you are not finding data which you are expecting there. And surprise, this is actually the better situation because you know something went wrong. What is even worse, sometimes you will get incorrect context. So instead of get, seeing data for your request one which you are handling, you actually get data for your request two or the other way around. And this is tr very tricky to identify. You usually find it only when it's too late and it's production. So how can this happen? The code was very clear. We know uh, it should work, but it doesn't. So there are two kinds of problems, two kinds of situation which lead to these problems. The first one, the first group is connection pooling. So for example, if we are using uh, HTTP keep alive to reuse connections for multiple uh, HTTP requests, or if we are using database connection pooling, then you will probably lose context. And here is why. So when the first request comes, we start the database query and the client library connecting to the database will have a a pool of connections, it will ask, hey pool, give me a connection. And there is no connection there, so we will open a new one and associate it with the context of the first request, right? Then we run the query, call the callback, and the callback is running in the context of our first request, all is good. And then the second request arrives, and uh, it, the client asks the pool, hey, do you have any connection there? And the pool said, yes, here it is, here is your connection. But this connection is associated with the first request. So by the time our query is executed and our callback is called, the callback is called in the context of our first request. And that's why we will be seeing contextual data from the first request. 
The second group of problems is what we call task queues. It's a similar thing, and it's usually uh, related to user land promise implementations. The idea is that we want to schedule a task to be executed at some point later in the future, and then call our callback when it's done. And the thing is, we, exec we schedule the task with a specific context, maybe the context of request two, but by the time the task is executed by the task queue, it's running in a different context, maybe the context of request one, or maybe there is no context at all, and then that's why it breaks. So, what can we do? This doesn't work. One answer is uh, explicit context passing. If you are familiar with Go, this is what they do for context passing. Basically, just put your context into your first function argument, and it works. It just, it's just language, fun, fun, ah, sorry, just passing arguments. It's all nice, very easy to understand. So we build our context, and then when we call query products, we give it the context. When we call get ratings, we give it the context. Everything works well. It's very reliable. There is no magic. But it's also a lot of work, and uh, what's more important, we cannot propagate implicit context. So with explicit context propagation, we don't know which API endpoint is calling slow SQL queries, and uh, we don't get long stack traces. So it's still not what we would like to. And now the question is, what do we want, right? And uh, I would like to define the holy grail here, which is five things. First one, we want this API to be built in. Because if there were many NPM packages implementing this same functionality, then connection pools like the PG client library wouldn't know which of them to support. And maybe they decide it's all user land and we don't care. And uh, it should be supported by all Node.js core modules like the HTTP module, etc. And what's very important, it needs to be supported by native promises. And this used to be a big issue for many years. Uh, next, uh, we want API to restore context. So if I'm implementing a connection pool or maybe a task queue library like Bluebird, then we want to tell Node.js Core, hey, this is the way how you should restore the context for this callback. And finally, we want good performance. We don't want to slow down Node.js by 50% just because we added support for context propagation. And now that we know what we are looking for, we can start the search, the quest. And the very first iteration started in 2013. It was called Async Listener. And it was kind of like an exploration of the problem space, trying to find out what can be done, how the solution would look like, and it was abandoned before release. The second iteration was slightly more successful. It was called Async Wrap. It was built on top of internals of Async Listeners, and it, the initiative ended up with getting undocumented low-level API which was good, but still not good enough. So then the third iteration was finally successful, and that's what we have today. It's called Async Hooks, and it's, it's great. It's a built-in API, but it's still experimental. It's supported by all core modules. was very important. It's supported by native promises as well. There is API to restore context, which I will show you later, and it has very little performance overhead. Perfect. But it's not very easy to use, so uh, that's why we have other modules building on top of that. The first one was CLS hooked. CLS stands for continuation local storage, combined with async hooks. And it worked pretty well with one caveat that you had to initialize this module as the very, very first thing in your application. If you didn't, then things would get started before CLS hook was in, was able to hook into all the different places and you might still lose context. So it was almost there, but not yet. And so finally, uh, the project decided that this needs to be implemented in core, really, and that's how async local storage was created in 2020, and uh, it's perfect. It's a public API, it's uh, stable, it's easy to use, it's no JS core feature, and you can use it in, since February 2021 in an uh, uh, active LTS version. So that's the history. And now I would like to sh show you how we can use these new APIs. Uh, first, let's start with async hooks. They are quite low level, and they are based on the design pattern of observers, maybe, or hooks. So first, we want to create a hook that will observe different events happening in the async machinery of Node.js. And there are different things you can listen for. For example, you can define a callback that will be called when a new async resource or maybe an async operation is started, triggered. 
and you will get a sync ID, which is a numeric ID you can use to keep track of this operation later on, uh, a type, which is describing what kind of resource this is, and trigger a sync ID, which allows you to connect uh, children to their parents to reconstruct the tree of a sync flow. And very important thing to remember is you have to enable your hook. Before you enable the hook, nothing happens, which is good for performance, but it means your hook will not work yet. So you have to enable it, after which things change in Node.js core and your hook will be called. And uh, if I if you use this code and try to see what happens, we can write a simple TCP server, which is accepting, a, which is listening on a port. When we start listening, our init hook will be triggered, telling us that a TCP server wrap resource with ID five was created, and this was triggered by ID one. And once the connection is accepted, we will see that TCP wrap resource ID seven was triggered by ID five. And here you can see the, the tree or like the connections between the different IDs. Seven is our incoming connection. Five is the server which is listening and one is like our application running up there. Okay, this is very low level. What is more important, I think a resource gives you a API to restore context manually. So for example, if we were building a message, a task queue, and it was all callback based, and we want to make sure this works with async local storage properly, all we need to do is call async resource.bind on our callback. And this will convert our callback function into a different callback, callback function that will restore the context for us. And then we can continue with our implementation as it was before. Now, what's even better, if you are using promises, you will get all of this for free. So if I was trying to convert the same function into a promise style API, I would wrap my internal implementation with the usual new promise resolve reject wrapper, and that's all. The context will be restored for me. And that's all you need to remember about, um, about async hooks. Next is async local storage, which is the thing you would like to use in your application if you are interested in context propagation. And uh, this is how you can use it. So first, you need to create an instance of async local storage. In other older solutions, there was a concept of namespaces and other things. Here, it's just the object instance. Each object instance is kind of its own namespace for, for data. And then in your server, you need to run your code inside a new uh, async local storage scope. It's similar to what we've seen before with domains and continuation local storage as well. And uh, what's important, then in your middleware and routes, you can access local storage uh, and it will be always the instance for your, for your request being handled. And what's important, you can choose what should be the store for your context. You can use a map, which will give you get and set uh, APIs, but you can use anything else, whatever works for application. And this is still a lot of work, so probably you don't want to write it yourself. So I recommend you to look for plugins for your favorite ORM frameworks. If you are using Nest.js, I think you will get context propagation out of the box. If you are using Fastify, there is this neat plugin called Fastify Request Context. You initialize it by registering it with the app, and then you get the request context by requiring the module, and this is cool. And this is all good, and there are still issues. We are almost there, but not exactly. Uh, the first one is that there are tricky edge cases. So if you are writing this integration code yourself, you must be very careful to understand all the mechanics. So in this example, we are uh, creating an HTTP server. We run our handler inside a new local storage context. And then we decide, okay, we want to read the request body and wait until the body is fully consumed. And only after that, we continue with our logic. And the thing is, this will lose your context. So we are back where we started. And the reason why it's this way is that you create your local storage context after your request and response objects are created. If you look at line two, that's where we are getting request and response. On line three, we are running our code in the new context. So there is no way for the uh, async local storage runtime to know that you should be assigning these two or binding these two request and re response object to our, uh, to our context scope. So be aware, there are edge cases, and again, you should prob probably not write the integration with async local storage yourself, use a plugin which already solved the issue for you. 
some user land modules are still catching up. So for example, the PG client, which is a very popular library for connecting to Postgres, if you are using callbacks, you will lose context because they didn't call async resource that bind. But remember, promise is always fix context propagation issues for you. So if you are using the promise-based variant, all works. Great. And this is good. But then there are modules which we call abandonware, things which haven't been updated in many years. For example, the Q module, there was the last release in 2017. It still has 14 million downloads a month, and I don't think it will be ever updated to support context propagation. Yeah, but if you are using Bluebird, which probably you shouldn't by now, but if you are using Bluebird, then Bluebird is calling a single resource that binds, so it will restore the context for you, that's good. And if you run into any issues with, with, with context propagation, a nice module was uh, added recently. It's called Async Break Finder, and it helps you to detect where exactly you are losing your context. So we can start by looking at your application as a whole and then slowly uh, reduce the scope where the problem could be until you pinpoint the specific line of code where you can then use uh, async resource that bind or add a promise to fix the issue. So that's very useful. And that's it. I would like you to remember three takeaways from my talk. First one, I think local storage is finally here after so many years in making. It's stable, supported by Node.js LTS versions. If you are using promises and I think await, then you are fine. You don't need to worry about anything. And finally, please choose modern and actively maintain dependencies so that you don't end up with queue deep in your dependency tree, losing your context. That's all. Thank you for your attention. You can follow me on Twitter and find the slides on the web. Great work. <laughs> all right, so the next talk's gonna be a little special. Um, one of our speakers couldn't make it, but they pre-recorded a video, so we're going to uh, show a video, and then Santiago, the other half of the next presentation, is here, and will take over after the video. So uh, we have Marianne and Santiago say, talking about dot line trace, instrument your Node.js applications with open source software. Let's give, uh, let's give uh, Marianne a round of applause, and then we'll start the video. My name is Marian Villa, I'm senior full stack product designer at NodeSource. I also want to introduce my colleague Santiago Jimeno, senior software architect at NodeSource. As you already probably know, we work in observability, focusing exclusively in the Node.js runtime. But today we're going to discuss only what's available in the open source space to implement observability in your applications. Today we're going to present dot line trains, instrument your Node.js applications with open source software. And before starting our presentation, it's important that we keep in mind a few of the main concepts of observability. It is important to understand that when we talk about observability, we need to understand what questions we seek to answer or clarify when detailing a system. The first questions we undoubtedly ask ourselves is why my application will have a certain behavior. And to solve this, another question, the first thing we must do is instrument our system. So that our application can emit signals that these traces, metrics, and logs. When we do this in this correct way, we have the necessary information that we needed. But what is observability? So in synthesis, observability is the ability to measure the internal states of a system by examining its outputs. Your system and apps needs proper tooling to collect the appropriate telemetry data to achieve observability. But what is the telemetry data that we need? The three main pillars of observability will be first metrics as dots, logs as lines, and traces as traces. When we name our keynote in this way, because with dots, lines, and traces, you have the whole picture of your system. And we want to create a direct reference to the basic core concepts of visual representation in a plain planning metric. But let's jump to dig a little bit more of this concept, not just enunciate them. First, start with metrics. 
Metrics are aggregations over a period of time of numeric data about your infrastructure or applications. Examples include system error rate, CPU utilization, and request rate for a given service. Briefly, a metric is a measurement about a service captured at runtime. Then jump to our second core concept, logs. A log is a timestamp message emitted by services or other components. They are not necessarily associated with any particular user request or transaction, but when they are, they become more useful. We'll get into this in a little bit later. Before defining what a trace, our third concept is, we should define the concept of a span. A span represents a unit of work or operation. It tracks a specific operation that a request makes, painting a picture of what happened during the this time in which that operation was executed. A span is the building block of a trace and is a name time operation representing a piece of the workflow in the distributed system. All traces are composed of spans. That's why the importance of this concept. And before jumping directly into traces, let's talk about context propagation. It's an important functionality that is required to implement distributed tracing. We can define it as a mechanism of storing state and accessing data across the lifespan of a distributed transaction, either across a securing context inside a process or across the boundaries of the service that conform our system. For in-process propagation, we will typically use something like async local storage class from the async hooks model. And for across processes, it will depend on the IPC protocol used. As an example, for HTTP, there's the trace context specification from the W3C, which defines the transparent and translate headers to propagate tracing info. Now it's time for the third core concept traces. A trace records the paths taken by requests made by an application or an user as they propagate through multi-service architectures like microservices and serverless applications, it is also known as distributed trace. Without tracing, it's challenging to pinpoint the cause of performing performance problems in a distributed system. We just define the concept of tracing, then this all sounds like very abstract. What does this really mean? What is this good for? Let's see it with a very simple example with the same architecture we will use in our demo. We can clarify this for you. So let's say that we have a distributed application like the one in the picture, which I said with the application will be demonstrated later. It has four Node.js services, API, Alt, Service 1 and Service 2 and one database. Imagine we having intermittent performance issues um, they could come from several points, wherever is the database access, network link status, or DNS request latency, etc. Finding where exactly may become a very hard and time consuming task. The harder, the more complex the system is. Distributed tracing is going to help us a lot with that, as we'll be generating tracing info on every point of the distributed system A, B, C, D, and E. Not only that, with the request goes through all the services, thanks to context propagation, some tracing state is going to pass along so all the tracing info can be linked in, in a very same request. Also, that info will be exported to a backend service where we can easily visualize and analyze the data, allowing us to identify where the issues may come from. More on this later on the demo. And before that, it's really important to talk about instrumentation. First, instrumentation is the process of adding observable decode to your application. We can do it either automatically or manually. With automatic instrumentation, our instrumentation libraries will take the configuration providing true code or environment variables and do most of the work automatically. In the following example, using the Open Telemetry SDK, we show how we can automatically generate spans of every HTTP transaction handled by the Node.js HTTP core model. Manual instrumentation will require more work on the user developer side, enables far more options for customization from naming various components with OpenTelemetry, for example, spans and the traces, and to add in your own attributes, specific exceptions, handling, and more. See the following example where it shows how to manually generate the span also using the OpenTelemetry SDK. 
Okay, all about open telemetry sounds good, but how do we correlate data? The way we historically will implement a typical observability pipeline is shown in the following picture. In this case, having all the data at your disposal is great and can give us a valuable overview of our system. But unless we are able to somehow correlate the observability signal metrics logs and traces, we won't be able to have the best of it. Open telemetry comes to solve this problem. The solution is going to come from correlate these signals. This can be done by applying the same concept of context propagation that was used for traces to metrics and logs. So that identifiers such as the trace ID and the span ID are associated with those signals. So for example, for logs, if we can correctly identify which specific request generate the actual log ratio, we will have more useful information to take decisions. But open telemetry is much more. It defines an API, which defines data types and operations for generating and correlating tracing, metrics, and logging data. We have SDK. It provides language-specific implementation of the API. We have OTLP, a protocol to transport the telemetry data. Uh, we have a collector to receive, process, and export telemetry data. And finally, we have semantic conventions to have a well-defined naming for the attributes associated to the signals, service name, HTTP, port, etc. Next, Santiago will present a demo in which we will showcase some of these open telemetry features along with other open source tools. Santi, the stage is yours. Hello. Well, thank you, Mariam. We're missing you here quite a lot. But let's focus now on the demo I'm going to show you. Uh, yeah. So uh, we can see here the, the application that uh, Mariam was showing before with the, all these four services and the Postgres database uh, in which we have other uh, observability. What we are going to do is like, we're going to collect uh, the data, uh, extract the data from the four services by using the OpenTelemetry API. And let it, uh, later on, that will be exported to the, the specific backends. Uh, we're going to use, in this case, Jagger for traces and Prometheus for, for metrics. Uh, also, notice here that uh, the way in which the data is going to be exported is going to be a bit different. So for traces, we are going to use OTLP over HTTP and send that data to Jagger, whereas Prometheus is going to, to pull the metrics data from, from, our, from our services by using HTTP. So let's go now directly to the code. Uh, can, this in, can you see it well? Yeah. So uh, first thing I'm going to show you how easy it is to, to to add uh, observability to your application by using the OpenTelemetry SDK. So I have grabbed everything in this setup function here, but before looking into that, I'm going to highlight some of the most important uh, classes that the SDK pro provides. First of all, we have the node tracer and meter providers. Those two uh, allow us to actually extract the data from our services, whether they are traces or metrics. Then we have the OTLP trace and the Prometheus exporter. Yeah, the, they're going to export data in those protocols. And finally, we have the resource, the resource uh, class. So in resource instances, what we're going to do is store um, specific attributes that are, allow us to describe uh, perfectly the process we're running on. So later on, we can like uh, link uh, from which process uh, uh, the data plan came from, right? In, in our case, we are going to use only two attributes. Just for the demo, we're going to use the service name and container ID. Uh, notice that these two attributes and others are well defined by the specification and we can get access to, to them by using the semantic convention's uh, module, right? So going quickly through the code, uh, first of all, what we do is create a, a setup tracing. We create the node tracer provider with a resource attached, we set up the OTLP over HTTP exporter and point it to the Jagger endpoint so it can consume that. Also here, we, we use this helper to raise the instrumentation uh, to enable automatic uh, uh, trace generation from some of the most popular Node.js uh, core modules, whether it's imagine HTTP or some of the popular modules as Fastify or whatever. In case we want to generate uh, spans manually, we can do it as well. For that, we create an instance and we work with that. Um, yeah, that's for traces. Um, for metrics, 
basically the same. We create a meter provider with a resource attached. We set out the Prometheus exporter, and finally, we create a meter instance that is going to allow us to create meter instruments such as counter, gadgets, histograms, etc. And just last thing before yeah, going to the demo is uh, what we do in our, in our actual service. So this is one of, our, of the four services. Basically, all of them are the same, are Fastify servers. Nothing too fancy there, but what is important to notice is that we need to set up our serability before our actual code. And there's a reason for that, is that the instrumentation modules that we we're talking about, the HTTP and Fastify in this case, what they actually do is they monkey patch the, the module they are actually instrumenting, so we, we need to do that beforehand. Then we're going to also set up uh, three, three meter instruments for every service, the same for, for every one of those, an HTTP request counter to, to track the number of requests processed, and a couple of gadgets to track CPU and ELU usage. So that's it for, for the code side. Let's just spin up spin up the demo, sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, there we go. And send the first request. So yeah, uh, what we can see is that uh, the request actually went, actually went through, but yeah, it was answered with a 401 authorized, so there are some issues there. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, try to look at the telemetry data we have collected, and. Yeah, let's try to figure out what's going on, okay? So, uh, okay. First of all, I'm going to show you the Prometheus uh, UI here. Let's see if we are actually receiving the, the metrics in form. Yeah, so we have here the ICV request counter. And what, what we can see here is that uh, there's been one request processed by the API service and another one uh, by the app service which makes sense. Also, also notice that the attributes we set in the resource are already there. We have the container ID and the service name. So we can relate those. Uh, let's take a look at the other two, just in case. Uh, it was process CPU. Okay, yeah. Four services are, are sending data about this. In this case, because it's a lot, probably it's more, more useful having this graph. On which line we can see how uh, the CPU usage evolves on every one of the services. So, looking good. Uh, the same for the thread even loop utilization. Yeah, everything is there. So, as far as metric goes, it seems to be working fine. Let's go to the Jagger backend to see if we have received any, any traces. And yeah, we have received one that corresponds with the HTTP request that we just sent to the to the application, looks good. It consists of three spans with an error, goes through two of the services, API out, that matches with the information we, we got from the metrics. Before inspecting this a little bit more, I'd like to make you notice the, this graph above in which every point will represent a trace where the x-axis would be the time the trace was, was created and the y-axis would be the duration of the trace. Later on, more on that, okay? so. Let's just inspect this for a moment. As, as we saw before, there are three, it consists of three spans here. Everyone represents an HTTP transaction. And uh, all of those have been automatically generated by the instrumentation HTTP module. So there was no code that needed to be added for, in order to, to make this work. Just for, yeah, so you can see what the instrumentation, the instrumentation module does. It, it doesn't only track the transaction, but it only collects data that is going to be very useful in order to uh, almost completely identify what the transaction looks like. So for example, you have the, the method here, I don't know, the URL, the status code, the status test, content length, etc. Uh, and finally, I'd like to point you out to these logs. So as I think, uh, as Maria mentioned before, uh, uh, having a log that is linked to a specific span is where the log becomes more, more useful because we actually know which exact request caused the creation of this log. So if we look into this log, we can see that basically describes a, it's a, it's a JavaScript error, right? With a message and a stack trace and yeah, 
by looking into the message, we know that we were missing the token to be authorized in the system, so we know what to do next. But before that, I'd like to point out that uh, attaching logs to traces is not done automatically by the instrumentation module, but we had to add some code, not, not too complicated, quite simple with the Open Telemetry API. So what we do is that in case of the verification of the token was failing, what we do is like extract the active spam from the current context. This brings back to the this bring us back to the context propagation stuff. So we extract that and then uh, we associate the error to the spam by using the record exception method. And yeah, basically that's it. Well, so let's now try to send a a request that actually authenticates or is authorized by the system. No, there we go. Uh, yeah, it went through. It sent us back some data. So let's take a look at Jagger to see what was different between those. So if we go here, we can see that already there are some differences. Of course, no errors. Seven spans. It went through three of the different services. But uh, there's some very nice tool that Jagger provides that allows us to convert traces, which I think is amazing. So what you can do here is you can see here is like in, in gray. Uh, the, the, the nodes in gray are the nodes that are, are the same between those traces, whereas in green, the ones that are new. So we can see that in, the, in this last request that went through, once it was authorized, uh, the API service sent a, a get to the service one, which then, yeah, perform a couple of operations to, to the Postgres database. Yeah, it connects to the pool and, and perform a query. Before jumping on, I'd like to show you yeah, what one of these spans related to Postgres, to Postgres look like, because I think it's quite nice. So this one that represents the query operation, as we can see here, was automatically generated by the instrumentation PG module. And yeah, everything that you, oh, some stuff that is very useful, like the whole query, the connection string, uh, you know, the, the type of database, also very useful. So you get all that info like automatically. Okay, so now just one final thing. Um, I'd like to show you something that I think can be more interesting. What I'm going to, oh, let me see. Yeah, there we go. So what I'm going to do now is like inject quite a bit of load into the application. You know, 25 seconds without a canon, uh, 15 connections. Uh, let's see how the how the application behaves, and then make some investigation or whatever. So. Okay, there we go. So here's the latency table and some interesting things that appear here. It's like. If we look at the NTS percentile, we can see like, okay, most of the, of the requests are, yeah, are being responded fast. I mean, around 200 milliseconds or less, yeah. But, you know, there are some, a few of those that uh, are terrible. They're more than three seconds and something's going on. So let's see if by looking at the, the data we have collected, we can figure out what's going on and why, why this happened. So, First of all, I'm going to go to Jagger, uh, filter like a little bit more of traces, and there we go. So now we're going back to the, to the picture I was explaining before. What we can see here is like quite consistent with what we were seeing in the latency table. I mean, most of the requests are really served fast, but there are some outliers here that are awful, terrible, right? So, Let's see if we can compare two of those, one of the fast ones with one of the slower ones, and yeah, start from there. So I pick one of the slow, 35, and this one. So we're going to compare those, and what we see is that everything is practically the same, but in the slower one, service one, after performing the query to the database, it sends a request to service two. So it seems that the main culprit here, the main suspect would be this this branch, so something there when service one sends a request to service two. So let's see if we can confirm that somehow. So one thing that we can do as well is if we inspect to 
this trace and use this trace graph view, we have this, this graph in which every node represents also a span. But the good thing about this is that in the left-hand side, what we can see is the time that uh, the trace that would have this node as root takes, and it compares that uh, against the whole trace. So if we're in the root node, of course, 100%, but if we go down through the different branches and pick the one that takes more time, we can just, yeah, 99.2%, yeah, 999 well, what we can, we can see here is that basically, yeah, our suspect was the one. An important thing to notice here is that it's not that service one is taking so much time in processing. I mean, it's taking time, but it's not that bad. Most of the time it's here. So it seems to me that requests that go from service one to service two somehow are buffer and it takes a long time for them to, to be processed. But yeah, let's investigate a, bit or, a little more. So now we go to Prometheus. We're going to check the, the event loop utilization of the main thread. Yeah. And what we can see is this, yeah, this peak here for a while. But yeah, it's not that bad. Something's wrong. Anyway, uh, the 3D loop has gone up. It should have been 100%, but I think there are some issues. But the thing that is giving us this peak is that, yeah, it's actually telling us that there's a lot of usage of the loop of the, of the service to uh, JavaScript thread, and it's making uh, it to like take a long time uh, sending responses back and yeah, having this like buffering of the responses that going, going into. So let's try to get now to the code if, to see if we can figure out what's going on. So yeah, this is not very original, but what I'm doing here is yeah, a high CPU road, and I'm calculating Fibonacci numbers here. So it makes sense. Yeah, these are high intensive operations, and it makes sense that we were seeing what we were seeing, right? Uh, I mean, this is not what your actual uh, production code will look like at all. Usually, it would be more, much more complex. Much more complex. Not so easy to spot where the problem is, but at least what you can see is that by using this this technique, what you can do is like narrow down. At least what we have been able to do is that narrowed out to a specific service, uh, even to a specific, to a specific uh, route. Yeah. In more complex cases, it would be great to use this along with other things like perf, running perf on the, on the service, or CPU profiler, et cetera. So that's my demo. I hope you have enjoyed that. And yeah, I'm going to go back to the slides to wrap this up. So. Uh, which are the main takeaways? Well, first of all, setting observability, observability in Node.js by using the OpenTelemetry SDK is not that hard. Um, actually, the, uh, the OpenTelemetry documentation is quite, quite good and complete and have some very good examples there. Also, uh, it allows us to observe requests as they propagate through a distributed system, and it allows us to identify points of failure or, or some bottlenecks in your system, yeah, right? And one last thing is like, yeah, adding observability to our code is great, but you have to be careful because, yeah, it's, it's not free. So depending on the tool and on the, um, especially on the amount of data that you're trying to collect, you, you know, your performance is going to, to suffer from that. So there's always a balance there, okay? So that's it for me. I hope you have enjoyed this. Uh, some links over there. The link below is where the demo is if you want to play around with it. I have to make it public yet, so I'll do it in a few minutes. So it's n it should not be already available, but I'll do that in a few. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you from Mariam. She, I mean, she was devastated not to be able to be here, but anyway, that's life. Okay, so thank you very much. If you have any questions for me, I, I'll be around, and yeah, I hope you enjoy this. Thanks. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so it's a little early, so we've got about seven minutes before the next talk is supposed to start. So it's been about an hour and a half since the last break, so if you want, stand up. Let's stretch it out. Yeah, I see some stretching going on. Good stuff. But yeah, you don't want to be sitting for too long. All right.
Well, I'm going to get off stage until 12.30, and uh, I will be back in a few minutes. So have fun.
Um, I'm going to give a 30 second warning since we're starting a teeny bit late. So any stragglers out there, if you hear me, come back in, please. If you want to see the talk, if you want to stay outside and talk, that's fine too, <laughs> of course. But uh, cool, cool, cool. It looks like we've got a bunch of people coming on in. So um, we've got Paolo here. Paolo is going to talk about Node on mobile. And his fun fact is he is from the future. And when he told me that, I kind of took one look at his jacket and was like, yeah, that tracks. So give it up for Paolo. Oh, there's music. OK. Cool. All right. Um, this jacket is actually quite hot. I'm going to take this off. <laughs> I thought this would be a good idea, um, but I am boiling in this thing. OK. Um, so I'm here to tell you. Actually, no, I'm going to leave this on because it's cool. OK. In 2010, uh, well, 10 years ago, um, I was, uh, I was uh, founding a company called Nojitsu. And I was kind of a Heroku for Node.js, a platform as a service. And over the past decade, there's been a lot of things like it, but better. And uh, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service and, uh, and the products built on them, they've become unsustainably complex. And the cloud is, and I say this as a veteran of DevOps, that uh, it's a house of cards. And what's worse is that as builders of the web, We've found ourselves in a landlord-tenant relationship. But all of that is changing because we've entered a new era of ubiquitous computing. And we've seen a proliferation of hardware and data. And today, I want to talk about why this is pushing storage and compute from the cloud towards a network of peer-to-peer. Because this isn't a prediction talk, I'm actually going to show you a framework. I'm actually going to show you a new runtime. And um, I'm also, um, I'm, by the way, not the first person to have this perspective. Uh, Peter Levine from uh, Andreessen Horowitz did a really great talk entitled The End of Cloud Computing in 2016. And then in 2019, he doubled down on this uh, thesis, delivering a really great keynote at the A16Z Summit. Uh, so here we go. All right, so computing, what drives us toward or away from decentralization or from centralization? Um, in the beginning, everything was centralized. Right? And they were centralized for a reason. Computers were the size of a room. And the upside was is that a few million people were computing. But the downside was that a few million people is relatively few people. But clearly, there was a demand. So the cost of microprocessors went down, and we had the personal computing revolution. Hardware sales boomed, and suddenly 2 billion people were computing. And uh, this was good. This was great. People were very happy. Hardware, hardware sales boomed. But uh, there was a new problem, which was that sharing data was really difficult. Okay, So we took a swing back towards uh, centralization. It was distributed, but it was highly asymmetrical. Right? Somebody said, basically, OK, uh, I'll plug in a computer. I'll turn it on. I'll make sure it's always on. We'll call it a server. Uh, you can pay me to access it, and it'll be a hub. And the upside to this was that you know, we figured out a pretty reasonably good way to share data. Uh, it was intuitive, and it made sense. And then information access sales boomed. Right? You had AOL. You had you know, companies like this that were all about information access and selling it to you. Uh, the problem was that there was growth, right? This was the dot-com era, right? And uh, you know, everything was booming. Uh, but servers were the bottlenecks, right? So we took a swing back to decentralization, to peer-to-peer. -peer. This is the peer-to-peer -peer era, the 2000s. And um, this was really caused by this, the, this quest to find protocols that scaled. Right? You had limitless access that scaled really well. Uh, millions of people were sharing petabytes of data. Peer-to-peer um, -peer proved itself as a very robust and, and great protocol. Um, infamous products like Napster 
Nutella Network, BitTorrent, all of these things became household names. Right? But the problem was is that you know, 80, it's the 80-20 power rule kind of applies here, right? 80% of peer-to-peer -peer model is very hard to wrap your head around, right? Versus client server. Um, and you know, sure, once you get to that 20%, uh, it scales really well, um, it's easy to maintain, but you know, all of this was tribal knowledge, right? And this is the pre-GitHub era, so very few people knew how peer-to-peer -peer worked. Um, copyright holders were also extremely upset. Uh, users expected everything to be free. Everybody was panicking. Nobody knew how to get anybody to pay for anything. And so we found ourselves going, uh, taking a hard swing back to uh, centralization. Uh, and this is really where we have peak cloud computing. Um, cloud platforms like AWS enabled people to build things like they couldn't before. Nobody had data centers, nobody knew how to do this correctly, and Amazon said, okay, we'll rent you the infrastructure, and uh, we'll handle the hard parts for a price. And Amazon did really well at this and entrenched everybody, uh, and every uh, half the internet or more is built on AWS. Uh, and uh, everything became a service. So here we are in the era of everything is a service. The upside is that improved UX and uh, subscription-based access, which investors love, uh, made it possible to ask users for money again. We'll give you all the content in the world for only $10 a month. Um, <clears throat> and uh, copyright holders are really happy with this. Man in the middle business is booming. Um, the problem here is that DevOps has become insane. And uh, you know, DevOps is a really, it's, it, we're, it's a house of cards, this whole situation. And worst of all, uh, like I said, it's, a, it's really a rent extracting model. Everybody's dependent on the cloud. But there's something taking us back very quickly to decentralization. And uh, <clears throat> that thing is, we want computing everywhere. Uh, we find a use case for computing in almost every corner of our lives. Right? And because of that, we're seeing a proliferation of hardware and data. We're entering the era of ubiquitous computing. Okay, controversy. How do we compare AWS to all this hardware that we're surrounded by suddenly? Well, you can't really compare it uh, Specifically, uh, there's, there's some nuances to how you compare it. Uh, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. The desire for ubiquitous computing has driven this hardware proliferation, but we need to put it into perspective as technologists trying to find utility in it, right? So today, there's about 7 billion people in the world, and there's about 15 billion mobile devices. And that doesn't count you know, 2.5 billion laptops and the countless IoT devices that exist. Uh, we're just talking about mobile devices here. <clears throat> so let's look at AWS. So AWS has about 38 data centers and 87 availability zones, uh, 27 regions, and uh, James Hamilton said, uh, most Amazon data centers house between 50,000 and 80,000 servers, so that's about three million servers. Um, and so clearly, there's more, uh, there's more hardware outside the data center than in any data center combined. But how is it fair to compare any of this? I mean, AWS servers, are, they're always, always on, mostly always on. Uh, they're really robust servers. So the only way that you compare this is, um, on average, the individual hardware is unreliable. It's online less frequently, and it's statistically less powerful. People have different uh, battery levels. Uh, people are, have different security settings. We consider all of this hardware unreliable. But uh, individually, a device doesn't replace a server. It doesn't run down battery ask, acting like a server, and it doesn't run up CPU acting like a server. Instead, individual devices make small contributions that constitute a larger, more robust network. And of course, all of this hardware proliferation is an opportunity, and it's leading to data proliferation. Basically, we're creating an insane amount of data, and it just gets more insane. Um, the velocity and the volume of data creation and consumption is a big driver back towards 
decentralization. So you probably heard, you know, the self-driving car generates 10 gigabytes per mile. And like, you know, uh, some cameras generate uh, 300 gigabytes of data per second. Sensors are popping up everywhere, right? There's sensors in everything. And almost everything in the world is generating some data about the world around it. And then we want to do something with that data. We want to do something with that data where, like, close to where it's being actually created. Um, so we want to create, process, and replicate that data as close to, as possible to where it's being created. But, you know, a, a good example is a self-driving car doesn't uh, want to send data all the way back to the data center to avoid a, a potential obstacle. Zero latency is affordable in that case. Medical data should stay private on premise in a hospital. Hospitals should be able to connect directly to each other. Um, a lot of pressure can be taken off, for example, Uber's servers if the rider can connect directly to the driver. Right? So this stuff is pretty obvious, but the question is, is like, you know, is, is it, how is it possible? Um, so round trips to the data center make less and less sense. But another driver that's really important, that's you know, something that's driving us towards um, uh, decentralization is the cost and the complexity of building uh, services, cloud services, and building on top of infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Um, growth. So as your application grows, as you have demand, you know, engineers end up bending over backwards to accommodate this. And the fact is, is that a cloud gets more expensive, more complex, and less reliable with growth. That's a fact. And I don't think there's anyone here that would agree with that or disagree with that. Peer-to-peer um, -peer gets less expensive, maintains the same complexity. And of course, it becomes more reliable as your network grows. So a lot of companies are seeing peer-to-peer -peer as a potential for, uh, for, for supplementing their existing infrastructure or escaping it entirely in some cases. So we saw these key drivers uh, that are pointing us towards decentralization, and uh, that's hardware proliferation, data proliferation, and cost complexity. And uh, this is really what's going to drive the next decade of uh, computing. And this is going to be what we uh, spend our time solving problems for. Uh, so we started a company to solve some of these problems. Um, we're early, kind of like we were early to Node, like we were early to the web, like we were early to all these other things. Um, we make it possible for the average developer to build peer-to-peer -peer apps using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, and then also provide tools to help with that at scale. Um, what we were looking for was a fundamental improvement. I think that, um, you know, for example, in the JavaScript space, there's a lot of competition for fast servers. And they're all incremental improvements of each other. And we call this horizontal progress. Right? All these solutions are racing to be slightly faster or maybe ergonomically better. Um, but what if apps could just communicate directly to each other? Better and faster servers really kind of lose their meaning and, and they become less important as uh, we have more direct transactions between applications. So with peer-to-peer, -peer, the responsibility becomes distributed and uh, users own the hardware and they take a degree of responsibility for participating in the network, storage, compute, network connectivity. Um, and so what we want, really, is to just remove as much of the cloud as possible without sacrificing any performance or reliability or security. And in order to do this, we realized what we needed was a new runtime. So servers are ideal for supercomputing super tasks, and browsers are great exclusively for client-server apps. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why they're not great for building software. Um, but SOC is a runtime that is for distributed web apps, like, so native apps built with the web stack. Uh, and it provides things that the browser just can't or won't. 
right? So local first capabilities, right? We want Bluetooth. We want to not have to use internet in adjacent, with, for adjacent devices. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer makes sense, um, but how do we unlock its potential? How do we, what, what does this runtime look like? Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir when I say this, but you know, obviously it makes sense to be aligned with the web here. The web has the largest, most active community, the best documentation, biggest backers, easiest to staff for, you know, uh, well enough patterns well-known patterns that uh, it's easy to iterate really quickly building software, and much easier than a lot of other uh, platforms may be. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, this is about as simple as it could get. So um, you can write some HTML, you can write some JavaScript, you can run the build tool, and uh, it will encapsulate your code in the runtime, and then it'll build it for mobile or desktop. And you can bring your front-end development framework, the one you like the best, React or Vue or Preact or Svelte or whatever people are building with today or tomorrow. Um, and um, that's about as simple as it gets. Uh, so I guess the question that uh, probably a lot of people are saying when they see this, is like, well, this is kind of like something I've seen, a little bit like something I've seen. Um, and the question is, why not Electron? Why not PhoneGap? Well, obvious reasons. PhoneGap only runs on mobile. Uh, it's also ancient. Uh, Electron is, uh, has quite a few valid criticisms about its uh, distribution size and its memory footprint. Uh, our binaries for desktop clock in at, uh, or uh, weigh in at about 1.5 megabytes. And that's it. And uh, on iOS, I think we're building at about uh, 13 megabytes. And um, on Android, about the same. Uh, less, actually. Um, so some of the things that we wanted to do, of course, was run on, on you know, all the major desktop platforms, but also the mobile platforms. We wanted to build in packaging. Build, packaging for Electron has like, got too many options, and it just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, we, we also wanted to make the back end optional, and we can because we're exposing these APIs like file system in the browser, polyfilling um, the, the APIs that don't exist yet or we don't think do the job. Um, and then we also expose UDP and Bluetooth, so you get these peer-to-peer -peer and local-first capabilities. And JavaScript uh, node, node developers will feel right at home here because our APIs are almost, ex well, they're compatible. Um, so the other thing was like, okay, so we built this runtime that you know, allows you to build cross-platform uh, native applications using the web stack. This is very cool. Um, did we have to boil the ocean and also build uh, the peer-to-peer -peer libraries on top of it? Well, there's some other peer-to-peer -peer libraries that exist, and uh, they have uh, uh, some reliability concerns, and we realized that when we were, when we were testing them, uh, because you know, we can't go to customers and say, hey, replace some of your cloud or all of it with something that we can't quantifiably, with empirical evidence, make claims to. Uh, so what we decided was that we needed to have a specification. And it needed to be informal and it needed to be formal. So um, I think a specification separates hobbyists from scientists. And personally, I'd rather debug a couple hundred lines of a specification than a couple hundred thousand lines of a distributed system that is incredibly difficult to reason about. Uh, and and passing, passing tests and GitHub stars and all of that kind of stuff, it really doesn't matter unless you have a specification that can be proved. Um, so take a detour really quick. And I'm going to um, put my browser over here. And I'm going to go to this document. So my co-founder, Dominic Tarr, and I have been writing this specification, and it's for NAT traversal. And so some of you may or may not know what NAT traversal is, but it's essentially the most important part of connecting peers together in a peer-to-peer -peer network. 
And um, I think that it's time. Where is it? Oh my god. Change visibility? Should I do it? Oh, I have to type it out. What's it called? <laughs> oh, good idea. We have a we <laughs> we we have a Stack Overflow user in here. <laughs> okay. Okay, maybe that's it. Okay, I can't see it on my screen over here. So, oh, is it not going to let me paste? Oh, it is. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. We can do this. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> this is what we want. Paste. Okay. Luckily, we have this ability too. Okay. <laughs> Visibility is already public. OK. OK, so that's a nat traversal spec. OK, now, we still have some other things here. OK, so um, OK, so, so that's a spec. So we want a spec. Now, that's the informal spec. So what we've been, what we've been doing is we've been working on the um, the, the formally verifiable part. So if anybody's familiar with TLA+, uh, that's what we're working on right now. Uh, it gives you a way to mathematically formally verify the states of things. So I have an initial state, and I have following states, and all those states can be enumerated, and then you can have a deterministic distributed system. And that's really important, because the cloud isn't deterministic or formally verifiable because it's all behind, it's all private. We don't know what it does. Um, OK, so that's the NAT traversal spec. So the internal kind of high level overview of the runtime is that you know, we basically we take libuv. Uh, right now, just a small subset of libuv uh, to do these basic things that we need to do, like UDP. And uh, we bridge that to the operating system component called the WebView. WebView historically wasn't very consistent, but now it is. Um, and so this allows you to basically get exactly the same uh, rendering across all of the platforms. And you know, gives you these nice primitives, like a correct file system access and uh, you know, a, a, a complete uh, uh, networking stack. Um, so like I said, all of the APIs are um, really quite inspired by Node. Um, in fact, pretty much compatible. Um, and you know, I, I just want to like briefly before I run out of time, I have two minutes. Um, talk about security. So Electron, bad idea. Node and HTML went sandbox. So what we're trying to do is bring together the best parts of the security of the web and combine that with the best parts of the security of the desktop uh, and the capabilities of the desktop and mobile. Uh, so sandboxing is super important. Um, and then obviously there's some things to follow along. You know, to not be. Um, uh, to, to not make some big mistakes. Uh, and we have guides uh, on, the, um, on the documentation here. So uh, there's guides over here for building things. And then really quickly, um, I want to try to just show, here's my terminal, but I won't be able to look at it. So I'll have to kind of, here's, here's the code. Um, you know what? Let's. Let's open source it. OK. Uh, OK, that's not the right one. Uh, we want this one. Socket. OK, so here it is. Uh, it's in alpha, but I think it's ready. No more, no more really significantly big changes. We're going to make it public, and we're going to copy and paste this.
OK, it's open source. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, I have 14 seconds left. Okay, well, if anybody wants, I'm gonna do demos for each and every single one of you. I'm gonna show you how to use it if you're interested. So come and find me, and uh, we'll build peer-to-peer -peer apps, and we'll escape the tyranny of the cloud. Thank you. Great work. Thank you so much. All right, so, um, Lunch is at 1, which is shortly. Um, if you have not heard, tonight there is a gala dinner. Don't worry. You're, what you're wearing is fine. Um, and there will be a casino night after. The dinner is at 7 in the restaurant on the fourth floor, uh, so the one you go up the stairs from the lobby to go to. And then there, the casino night will be in the room adjacent. Now, we have some really great workshops today uh, after lunch. Um, let me pull out my phone and... Uh, Look at them real quick, because I forgot to do that. Pardon me. Um, all right, so we've got Intro to TensorFlow, which is uh, machine learning. We've got Introducing the Platformatic DB, which is a uh, new database technology. We've got You Can Build Apps with IPFS. And we've got Elevating Node.js Applications to the Cloud. So look forward to those. You can find more information on the NodeConf EU website. And hopefully, you have a wonderful lunch. I've been your MC today. Thank you very much. Have a great day.